Good afternoon. Welcome back to the Montgomery County Council. Uh, this is a proclamation that I am really excited to watch. Um, a proclamation recognizing International Women's Day by the six new female majority members of the County Council. Right? Um, and so, without further ado, Council Members Balcom, Fonny Gonzalez, Ludke, Mink, Sales, and Stewart. The show is yours. Thank you, President Glass. I want to call up our special guests. We have the Montgomery County Commission for Women. We have Montgomery County Chapter of the National Organization for Women. I believe we have some representatives from Emerge Maryland and the National Council of Negro Women. All right. So this is a really momentous occasion um, that six women are up here on the council today, something that has never been done before in our county. I echo, um, I first want to invite each of my council members to come and uh, give brief remarks. Yes, come on in, come on in. So each of um, the councilwomen are going to give remarks and then we're gonna start the proclamation. Right. Thank you. This is a very exciting day for all of us and um, thank you to Councilmember Sales for pulling us this together. I think that the, the issue of why is it so important to, uh, to identify and celebrate these days, International Women's Day, is because represent representation matters um, the saying is, you can't be it if you can't see it. Uh, so for all the young women out there, um, this is, you can see it now, and you can see yourselves here, and um, I think that this is just, uh, just the, one of the many ways that we can be a more res representative community, and I am so fortunate to be sharing uh, this council with these five women. Uh, it was a bit of a um, surprise when we all won, but it shouldn't be because, uh, and one of the things that I said right from the very beginning, um, we didn't win because we were women. We won because we are highly qualified and we ran really good races. And so, and sometimes I feel like we're a little bit of a dog and pony show, <laughs> but I don't ever want anybody to, uh, to forget that fact. So thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, what a great honor is to be here. Uh, when I think about International Women's Day, I think of my mom. I came with my mom from South America when I was 16 years old with nothing. Uh, we didn't speak English, we didn't have any papers, we were just, you know, like many immigrants who come to the United States. Um, and I think of her because she taught me to be strong, to always do the right thing with principle, and to use my power as a woman to, to make a difference in our community. So I thank you all for being here with us, and I thank my mom who's watching from heaven, um, to all of us, you know. Um, we work together to make sure our community is stronger for everybody. So thank you. When I think about International Women's Day, I, I think about all the people who've come before us who were probably told no or that's not for you. 
and didn't care and went and did it anyway. Uh, because of them, we're able to be here doing what we do now. And um, I thought back about my college experience. So I, I, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, and um, the oldest performing arts group at the university was founded in 1862. It's the University of Pennsylvania Glee Club, which was an all-male singing organization. But I joined the group, not to sing. They needed help learning how to dance. So I was their choreographer, and uh, at first as a quote unquote associate member, and then they decided to make me a full member of the group. And then I ran for their board of governors, um, which had never happened before. And everybody was a little like, well, wait, is that a thing? Can we do that? How does that work? And so I ended up becoming the first woman ever elected to that Board of Governors in 1995. And I'm proud to say today that the Glee Club is now fully co-educational for singers, musicians, and tech staff, and that the group is now represented by President Rebecca Hennessy, who also has continued on in this tradition. And so I'm excited to be able to celebrate with them in two weeks, their 160th anniversary. So don't take no for an answer. Go for yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to Councilmember Sales for putting this together. Um, I'm so glad to be here uh, celebrating this day with all of you. As I was reflecting on this, um, and you know, I was thinking about how when I was a kid, I, I certainly never imagined that I would be one day speaking as an elected official. Um, that never, it never even crossed my mind, um, I, I mean, as a possibility. And, um, and I, that is in large part because, you know, we are not who you see in the history books. So, you know, of course, I mean, I grew up in Montgomery County, so there's a lot of messaging about everybody can, can, can be whatever you want to be and all that. But the reality is when you're surrounded by, you know, when you see what you see in the history books, when you see what you see on TV, um, when you see what you see in, in, you know, in the news and in Congress, all of those, all of those things, um, it does not look like what you see before you today, what our county council here in Montgomery looks like today. Uh, and that's important. That's important, uh, you know, not just symbolically and, also, and, and not just for the kids coming up to, to see this example, but also because women are disproportionately impacted by so many of the different issues that we have the privilege of working on. So that representation is critical in an abundance of ways. Uh, I am honored to be a part of the six women on this council, and, uh, and I look forward to the good work that we will do together. Thank you, I'm glad to be here today. So when I look at the six of us, I think, wow, six women, a majority on the county council. But what really excites me is that we're six individuals that we are six women who come from different backgrounds, different upbringings, and represent different communities. And that's what really excites me about working with these women. And I want to say also, um, as my colleague, Council Member Fanny Gonzalez, said, you know, she thinks of her mother um, today. I actually dragged my daughter here <laughs> today who's home uh, on spring break from college because this is what International Women's Day means to me. It means diversity, it means inclusion, and it means uh, my family, my daughter, and looking at what she's going to accomplish in the future. So I also thank my colleague, Lorianne Sales, for organizing today and for all of you coming. Thank you. We have so much to be grateful for in Montgomery County, and I echo the sentiments of my colleagues who join me in advocating for gender equality, not just today on International Women's Day, which is officially celebrated tomorrow, but every day. Um, for this year's theme, Embrace Equity, I would like to acknowledge women's organizations in our county who are working tirelessly to reduce health disparities workplace discrimination, and gender inequality. Many of these organizations are here today. The Montgomery County Commission for Women, led by Chair Donna Rojas. 
the Montgomery County chapter of the National Organization of Women, led by President Jeanette Feldner, and the National Council of Negro Women, led by President Millie West Wiggins. Also, I do want to shout out Emerge Maryland, who was going to be represented by Shruti Bhatnagar, but she unfortunately could not join us today. Thank you to all of the women who came here today and all of the organizations who, didn't, who we were not able to mention, yet still do such groundbreaking work to uplift those who are struggling. I feel so much gratitude on International Women's Day this year as I reflect on the previous generations of women who had to protest, strike, vote, and do so much more in order to advance women's rights. I would not even be here today if it were not for them. And I stand here in their honor. And so without further ado, I'm going to ask my colleagues to join me in reading this proclamation before we present it to our, reci our receiving organizations and then our organizations are gonna provide brief remarks. So first we have council member Marilyn Balcom and we'll just go through in alphabetical order. Thank you. So I get to start off the proclamation. <clears throat> Whereas International Women's Day, which began in the struggle for women's and workers' rights, was declared an official holiday by the United Nations on March 8, 1977, to honor the feminist movement dedicated to equal pay, equal rights, reproductive rights, and the prevention of violence against women, and... Whereas... The theme for this year's International Women's Day, Embrace Equity, is a call to action for individuals to stand against bias and discrimination and work towards a more radically inclusive society and... Whereas Montgomery County has a county council led by a majority of women, these six women are tireless advocates and legislators who are representative of various backgrounds and ethnicities and are each making history in their own right. And? Whereas Montgomery County is a welcoming community for women, thanks to strong support from countless community leaders, government officials, nonprofit organizations, county agencies, and? Whereas Montgomery County has, Montgomery County was home for many years to women trailblazers such as Rachel Carson, the mother of the modern environmental movement, Claire Barton, founder of the American Red Cross, Emily Edmonston, a formerly enslaved person who worked side by side with Frederick Douglass in the abolition movement, and Whereas women belong in all, in all halls of power where decision-making happens, we will not give up until every one of us has the right to dignity, respect, and equal access to opportunity. Now, all together. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes International Women's Day as an essential global day to reflect and celebrate the immense contributions and sacrifice of women in Montgomery County and worldwide. When you go first, you can finish quickly. Hello, everyone. I just want to say this is uh, this is such an honor. As the Montgomery County for Commission for Women, we continue to strive to ensure that we are looking out and providing those services or assisting in those services for our women and girls in Montgomery County. We all stand on the shoulders of so many different women. I, I want to thank our our majority women uh, county council. I want to thank council member sales because this is so important because as you see us rising you also see some of our emerging leaders some of our younger girls see that that see us and know that they too can make a difference so as the montgomery county commission for women we want to thank our executive director jody finkelstein for always being there to help us out for being there for us she she's a true trailblazing woman for us and we all 
uh, appreciate the work that's being done here and we will continue the work to help women and girls in the county. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeanette Fellner from Montgomery County Chapter of the National Organization for Women. Um, I want to thank all the council members, male and female. They're all feminists and they're all working hard for us. <laughs> um, International Women's Day is, it's been a, uh, it started over a hundred years ago and, uh, but most of us didn't even know about it until recently. Uh, I found out about it, um, it, it wasn't that long ago and I was born on International Women's Day. <laughs> <laughs> But I guess it was the internet that spread the word, and um, and I was like, aha, oh, this is so perfect. Uh, so I've been working for on women's issues uh, since in since the early 70s, and um, you know, I I recognized the inequalities in my own life, and that caused me to join a women's organization that uh, could help make changes for all women. Uh, Gloria Stein, um, a hero of my wave of feminism, once explained, the story of women's struggle for equality belongs to no single feminist, nor to any one organization, but to the collective efforts of all who care about human rights, unquote. Collaboration is essential. Uh, this year's um, International Women's Day theme of embrace equality, uh, embrace equity, um, equity isn't just a nice to have, it's a must have. And it's critical to understand the difference between equity and equality. The aim of this year's Embrace Equity campaign theme is to get the world talking about why equal opportunities aren't enough. People start from different places, so true inclusion and belonging require equitable action. So we give equity a huge embrace, and this is what we do. Embrace equity. Take a picture, hashtag embrace equity, and take a picture of yourself and post it on social media. So when we embrace equity, we embrace diversity, and we embrace inclusion. Equity, equality is the goal, and equity is the means to get there. Through the process of equity, we can reach equality, maybe the Equal Rights Amendment. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I want to thank Councilwoman Thayer and all the other five ladies. It is because of you guys that we do stand here, and we supported you, and we will continue to support you. I'm Millie West Wiggins, president of the National Council of Negro Women here in Montgomery County. I stand here also as a 50-year civil rights worker. And so I stand, but the National Council of Negro Women, our mission is to uplift our youth, our community, and our women. And we are here to say thank you to all that know about us, work with us, we work with everyone, we have a goal, and the goal is to let everyone know that we are one. It is easy to stand in a crowd, but it takes courage to stand alone. And all of these are one. We are all one. And so again, thank you. Thank the councilman for acknowledging us, and we take this with great pleasure. Thank you. So I think we're going to have the council members, councilmen, come down and or come and join us for a quick picture <laughs> so we can finish uh, the rest of the council's business. And thank you, everyone, for coming out to support International Women's Day and the six new councilwomen. Thank you.
Okay, that was a great way to kickstart the afternoon. Thank you to the majority of the council for getting this afternoon started. Uh, we now have a series of public hearings this afternoon. Uh, first public hearing is on Bill 623, Housing Sharing Economy Rental, a triple joint committee has been scheduled. Uh, that is the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee, the Health and Human Services Committee, and the Economic Development Committee. Uh, and that joint work session, committee work session, will be scheduled for March 27th. Um, so this is a public hearing on Bill 623. The bill would define sharing economy rental, established a licensing system and certification requirements for sharing economy rentals, revise the definition of private swimming pools, and generally amend the provisions for residential rentals. Uh, those wishing to submit testimony for the council's consideration must do so before the close of business on March 16th. There are three people who wish to testify, two in person and then one virtually. So the two people in person, uh, Cameron Kilberg and Patricia Van Reichgrim, if either of you are here. Very good. Thank you. And you have three minutes. All right. Um, council President, Vice President, members of the Council, on behalf of Swimply, I'm here today in support of Bill 623 with proposed amendments. This bill would recognize and regulate home amenity rentals in Montgomery County. Swimply, who I represent, is a home amenity rental platform which allows homeowners to share underutilized portions of their home with their neighbors. While Swimply has started with the sharing of pools, we are moving towards a platform where all underutilized spaces, which are not sleeping quarters, can be shared, be it your yard for a dog to run or share your garage for someone to work on their car. We are an extension of the home sharing economy. While an extension of the home sharing economy, our concept is still new and as often as the case with technology, it expanded faster than regulations could keep up. We support this bill to ensure homeowners may share their amenities within a framework. However, we have a few amendments proposed to ensure smooth oversight. First, we ask under the Zoning Amendment ZTA 2301 that the restrictions on sites with accessory dwelling units be removed. While this restriction may not have been applicable for short-term rentals, rentals may have been applicable, it's not applicable for home amenity rentals. There's no lodging occurring and the ADU may actually be a space that could be shared, for example, may house the bathroom facilities for a pool rental. Second, we respectfully request that the inspection requirement in Section 25C6 be removed. There are currently no such inspections required for short-term rentals. It is unclear why these two home sharing flat platforms would not be treated equally. Furthermore, there are a variety of questions that remain outstanding, including whether there is the bandwidth to conduct such inspections and if there are clear and concise rules and standards around what is being inspected. We believe any interest in inspections warrants a separate discussion with the short-term rental providers at the table. And finally, the restriction on no more, no more than six adults per rental is not only hard to enforce, it would have detrimental effects on home amenity rentals and is also unequal to the treatment of short-term rentals. Simply does not charge different rates for adults and minors and this host do not always have this information up front. Furthermore, forcing hosts to limit their space in this way could be chilling to their rentals. Many of their spaces can appropriately accommodate more than six adults without causing a nuisance and thus the number appears arbitrary. And finally, short-term rentals may only have six adults for lodging purposes. The regulation does not restrict those lodging guests from inviting more adults over to enjoy the amenities the home provides. Thus, if a neighbor complained about a property being shared and there were 10 adults using the pool and it was a short-term rental, there would be no violation. But a home amenity rental host could be fined. We believe that the regulations in place around hours, primary residence, and the ability for one to lose their license for violations will help ensure any concerns around nuisance are abated. So again, I thank you for the time today and respectfully ask you guys to consider throughout the process Bill 623 with our proposed amendments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, since you said Patricia is not able to join us. To she, did some, she submitted online. Very that's good. All. Thank you very much. Um, so then next person is Tom Carlson, who's joining us virtually. <laughs> yes, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Carlson. I live in Rockville, Maryland, um, and really appreciate the, the, the time here today. 
Uh, I just wanted to um, speak in support um, of the legislation um, sharing economy rentals um, for the county, and, and really just simply because I, th I think it makes sense. I think it opens up uh, more options for county residents. Um, I think we've, we've all taken advantage, of, or, or most of us have, I, I assume, uh, uh, various aspects of the sharing economy. For me, the main one, of course, has been ride sharing and uh, making use of Uber and, and Lyft. And uh, I think this is a good opportunity to open up more options here, uh, specifically such as, you know, um, taking advantage of, of uh, sharing pools. Um, I also think um, I've heard about, actually, I have some, some friends that, that have dogs that have looked into the idea of being able to uh, uh, rent out um, someone's very large uh, backyard for their dogs to play. And I think that's another good opportunity. Um, and, and I think the other good piece of the legislation is just the fact that it also regulates it and it puts in some safeguards. I know the previous uh, speaker had some ideas on amendments. And it, it is really important, obviously, to look through and you know get the regulations right um, so that um, they make the most sense for the county. Um, and you know, another thing that I think has been noted is that there could be an environmental benefit as well if um, community members are able to share certain resources, reduce the need for certain things to be produced or installed. Um, you know, and, and finally, again, I think it's um, good to uh, do this in a way that protects community members, whether it's the ones that are renting out the space, renting space, or neighbors um, to those renting out certain spaces. And I think this, this legislation is attempting to do that. So with that, uh, thank you so much for the time and, you know, appreciate uh, your all's work and, and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Thank you, everybody, for testifying uh, in person, virtually, uh, or online. And with that, this hearing is now closed. Oh. No, I only have three people on the agenda. That's that's everybody who wished to testify. Uh, uh, if you want to come up, sure. Clearly an, an error in the clerk's office, but uh, I only have those three, so we'll we'll extend this. Yes, sure. Uh, yep. Yeah. And if you want to just state your name so that we have it for the but uh, uh, this is for item number four, Bill six twenty three, housing the sharing economy rental. Okay, so go ahead, hit hit the button. There you go, you have three minutes, and if you could share your name, please. I'm Constance Kiggins. I'm here to strongly oppose Councilmember Jawando's ill-conceived proposal that would effectively turn our neighborhoods into commercial zones. I live across the street in Chevy Chase from someone who has been renting out their pool, backyard pool illegally for three years and has continued to do so despite the county's ineffective attempts to stop it. This illegal activity has brought a parade of free people coming and going from as early as six in the morning to as late as 10 at night. I chose to live in a residential neighborhood because it is a residential neighborhood, an oasis of tranquility away from the traffic, noise, and congestion of commercial zones. I did not choose to buy a house across the street from a pool club or an auto repair shop or next to a dog park. Today these and other commercial activities are not zoned for residential neighborhoods for very good reasons. They should remain illegal. The proposed zoning change would permanently alter the nature of residential neighborhoods throughout the county creating innumerable problems and enforcement nightmares. It's a bad idea, it's bad public policy, and it should be defeated. Take pools. Chapter 51 of the Code of Maryland Regulations devotes 35 pages to swimming pools. The state regulations define a private pool as any pool built on the grounds of a single family residence and used by the owner, his or her family, tenants, and guests. By redefining guests to include paying guests, the proposed county legislation would, if enacted, effectively turn private pools into what under state law would be public swimming pools. The state law regulating public pools imposes stringent requirements governing their operation. It mandates that every public pool have at least one lifeguard for every 2,000 square feet of water, and for good reason regulates health and safety and everything from ladders and heaters to toilets, showers, cleaning, and more. Will the county impose and enforce regulations to protect health and safety like those the state mandates for all public pools? I doubt it. Today there are about 40 swimming pools in Montgomery County listed for rent on the Swimply website. All these pools are operating in violation of current zoning laws and the county has failed to stop it. So why should we have any confidence that the county would be able to enforce its own licensing and other regulations that would govern sharing economy rentals under the proposed zoning change? 
And just because some people are now in open violation of the current zoning laws by renting out their pools and operating other commercial enterprise is no reason to change the code. The bottom line, we don't need, nor do we want, our neighborhoods to become home to commercial swimming clubs that would bring with them the noise and the nuisance that would forever alter the tranquility of our homes and our neighborhoods. In buying my house, I chose a way of life in a residential neighborhood away from the kinds of commercial activities that this proposal would allow in neighborhoods like mine. Auto repair shops, dog parks, and yes, public swimming pools do not belong in our neighborhoods. I urge you to defeat this proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kiggins. And I saw that uh, you're, test you're set up to testify, signed up to testify for the next item, which is the associated ZTA. But uh, thank you okay, for your so testimony. For no, no, it's on the record. It's all good. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify uh, for the record uh, and uh, make sure everything was good. So with that, um, this public hearing is now closed. Uh, next item is number five, a public hearing on zoning text amendment 22. 13 accessory residential uses shared economy rental this zta will authorize and regulate the hourly rental of private residential property a joint health and human services economic development and planning housing and parks committee work session is tentatively scheduled for march 27th persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on March 16th. And Ms. Kiggins just provided testimony, so thank you very much. Um, and with that, this public hearing is now closed. It's all good, um, as long as we've heard from you, so thank you. Uh, next is item number six. This is a public hearing on Bill 1023, Health, Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Commission, established. This bill would establish an Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Commission, prescribe the membership and duties of the commission, provide for the staffing of the commission, and generally amend the law regarding the provision and coordination of services for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the county. A Health and Human Services work session, committee work session is scheduled for March 9th. Those wishing to submit additional testimony for the council's consideration must do, fo do so before the close of business on March 16th. There are 14 people here to testify, 12 in person and two virtually, so I'll call up the first five individuals, if you could all come up. Ken Hartman, Lisa, Lisa Lorraine, Smeal Soraya, Susan Hartung, and Stephen Riley. Very good. Um, thank you all. Mr. Hartman. Thank you so much, Council President Glass, uh, and good afternoon. My name is Ken Hartman Espada, Director of Strategic Partnerships in the Office of the County Executive. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the County Executive in support of Bill 1023 to establish an Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Commission. Mr. Elrich is very appreciative of the partnership with Councilmember Albernoz and his staff in working with him, the Commission uh, on for People with Disabilities, HHS staff, uh, and the families and guardians of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, or IDD, to bring this bill forward. Uh, County Executive was here this morning with you to commemorate National Developmental Disability Awareness Month. As you know, the County Executive is a parent of an fo adult foster child with IDD. Um, on a personal note, my sister and I recently became the guardians of my older brother with IDD. It is very, I can tell you, it's very frustrating and challenging to identify and obtain services if you don't know where to start or even what resources are available to you, it is easy to get stuck. And I'm grateful for the guidance uh, Mr. Elrich provided to me when I was stuck. The creation of an IDD commission will help people like me and others to learn about the available services, to navigate uh, what can be a very complex process and advocate for the needs of our loved ones. The IDD commission will bring together individuals with IDD, uh, parents, uh, family members, guardians, and service providers, um, uh, and others, um, uh, including uh, uh, agencies and the Commission on People with Disabilities to promote direct communication among families, support staff, private and public organizations, and the public, and to conduct educational programs, and to report to the executive and the council on gaps in services 
and research best practices and innovations and services, and to advocate at the county and state level on the needs of county residents with IDD. County Executive Elrich asked the council to unanimously support Bill 1023. Uh, he thanks uh, Councilmember Albernaz for his leadership, um, and he is committed to providing the staff support, both administratively and programmatic, necessary for the new commission to perform its duties. We look forward to working with the HHS committee and the council on passing this important measure and establishing this new commission. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lorraine. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Lorraine, and I am the Breaking Barriers Manager at Jubilee Association of Maryland. Jubilee is a Developmental Disabilities Administration residential service provider helping more than 150 adults with IDD live full and inclusive lives right here in Montgomery County. We received a grant in 2021 to conduct outreach to communities that have been underserved by developmental disability services. Data shows that in Montgomery County, people of Hispanic and Asian descent are not accessing services at the same rates that they are living in our community. I'm here to support Bill 1023 to create an IDD commission. We see at Breaking Barriers how much more attention and advocacy is needed for the IDD community in Montgomery County. Services for people with IDD are complicated to access even for people who are native English speaking, high income, and college educated. You can imagine how access becomes much more complicated for people who speak English as a second language, people who struggle to pay for rent or food, or those who don't have access to a computer and are not email users. Since 2021, I have worked with over 125 Montgomery County families, two thirds of whom are Hispanic. I've worked with both children and adults who need my help to access services. I'd like to share three recent stories with you. I helped the family of a 22-year-old with Down syndrome make their first appointment to apply for Social Security benefits, a benefit the young woman has likely been eligible for since age 18, but the family did not know that she could apply for it. I also called the office of a neurologist, that is a Medicaid provider, to advocate for a family who was told they needed to bring their own Spanish interpreter to the appointment, even though the medical office must provide an interpreter under law. And just last week, I assisted a family that was trying to understand their son's school placement and needed copies of certain school documents. It took three attempts with their MCPS middle school to get the documents needed. Having heard these examples, it may not surprise you that I commonly hear from families that they have felt discriminated against. In my work, I also collaborate with DDA service providers and many other disability professionals. If the public systems and providers continue doing business as usual, we will continue to have inequitable outcomes. But if communication is improved through culturally competent staff, flexibility and communication methods, and training in how to use interpreters, we may have a shot of having equitable services for all people with IDD in our community. A new commission would give space and resources to focus on the needs of our most vulnerable residents. The proposed commission would have the ability to advocate at the local, state, and federal levels, which is much needed as people with IDD interact with all of these systems. The new commission must focus on all people with IDD, especially those who have been marginalized by the system because of their race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or language abilities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lorraine. Ms. Saria. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Esmil Soria, and my son Daniel is a 16-year-old boy with autism. We live in Montgomery County, and Daniel goes to Rockville High School. I'm here to support Bill 1023 to create an Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Commission. I support the creation of an IDD Commission because more attention is needed for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in this county so that people like my son have the opportunity to live full, meaningful, inclusive lives. I took time off of work today because I think this is really important. Even though I speak English, I'm not a native English speaker and my English is limited. It's not easy for me to express what my son needs because of that. Sometimes I feel that when I'm trying to get help for my son, I'm discriminated against or treated a certain way because of the way that I'm limited in communicating. I feel like because I don't speak the language fluently, I can't express what I want. I don't ask for an interpreter anymore at school IEP meetings because I had interpreters in meetings and they don't communicate fully and clearly what is being said. 
Also, there is a disadvantage when I attend IP meetings because I don't know about the law. The jargon used is difficult for me to understand, and since I don't have enough money to pay a lawyer or advocate, I can only hope for the best outcome that can benefit my son. On the other hand, the school has lawyers, and the staff know about the process of the IPs. There are few places who can help advocating for free, such as Parent Place of Maryland and the Disability Rights Office. But unfortunately, due to the demand of their services, just to answer you a question takes more than a week. There are many people like me who can't advocate successfully for our children in the system and we feel like we are never heard. There are families who have technology barriers and don't even know how to use a computer or send an email. How will their children get what they need? People like me are really struggling with feeling heard and respected in the system, and this affects our children's lives. I think having a new commission that is focused on improving the lives of people with IDD will help focus support on much needed changes. The new commission must focus on all people with IDD, especially those who have been marginalized by the system because of a race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or language abilities. Thank you for letting me speak with you today. Thank you. Uh, next is Ms. Hartung. Thank you for letting me speak with you today. My name is Susan Hartung, and I'm here to express my strong support to establish a commission on intellectual and developmental disabilities. I'm wearing a lot of hats today. I'm a retired special education teacher, and today I work with over 100 providers of services for the developmentally disabled in Maryland. I have served on the board of directors for national and international organizations and chaired committees on the state, county, and level. Most importantly, I'm here as Warren and Emily's mom. Warren is 37 years old and has a developmental disorder called CAT 6A that has left him intellectually disabled, nonverbal, and with diminished muscle tone. Emily is 33 and classically autistic. None of this is meant to impress you, but to let you know, I do know what I'm talking about. During the last 40 years on this journey in the disability world, I have been able to see what can be done when people work together towards common goals. I have seen the satisfaction on an individual's face when they know they have contributed to the community they live in. I have seen a parent refuse to leave a program when, quote, they have never seen another or person enjoy working, spending time with their child before. I have seen parents and professionals bring their voices together to improve policies for those individuals who had no voice. I have seen barriers broken down to ensure that those who needed protection most during a health crisis received it. And all of this has happened here in Montgomery County. We have done amazing things, but there's much more work to do. In Montgomery County, there are 42,000 people between the ages of 5 and 64 with a disability. 24,000 of those are cognitively disabled. There's been a 71% increase in special education in our school system in the last 10 years. In the next six years, 900 students with a disability will age out of school services into adult services. Not only is this population growing, it is aging, and we are not prepared for it. We have early intervention services, transition to youth services, but what happens when the population ages? How are we going to meet the needs as they change? We need to look at providing services through the lifespans. And one of those is housing. 48% of those with an intellectual disability over the age of 18 live with a family member. What happens when those family members are not long, no longer able to provide a home for them? Another support is employment. In Montgomery County, the unemployment rate is 4%. For the developmentally disabled population, is 84.5%. And what about those who aren't receiving services? The waiting list for services in Montgomery County is over 600. These are individuals who have been identified as having a developmental disability, but DDA does not have the funds to support them. And as you have heard, and this number does not represent those we don't know about. For those who do not speak English, who must work two or three jobs to support their family, finding the resources and the time to navigate the system to get the services they need can be an impossible task. Montgomery County has always provided for its most vulnerable citizens, but the needs are growing. A commission dedicated to anticipating the needs of the developmentally disabled and finding ways to collaborate to meet those needs means that we can continue to be a community where everyone belongs, are included, and everyone can truly live their best lives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stephen Riley. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, turn your microphone on. Sorry. 
So, Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President, members of council. Thank you for the opportunity to appear in support of this bill, uh, which is important legislation to establish a uh, new vital resource in the county. I'd like to thank uh, Council Member Albernaz and Council Vice President Friedson for their leadership in introducing this and to ask all of you to support it. I'd also like to thank the County Executive whose leadership on this issue is well known to me and to members of this community for over many years. Uh, my views on this topic are informed by three things. One, my uh, status as what is politely described as an aging parent of an adult uh, Montgomery County resident with IDD. Uh, my two terms of service on the Commission on People with Disabilities. And thirdly, uh, my work with Potomac Community Resources, a local nonprofit which since 1994 has worked with the county and partnered with the county to promote the full inclusion of individuals with IDD into all aspects of community life. The, commission, the IDD commission uh, that's proposed by the legislation will promote the civil rights and interests of county residents with IDD and of their loved ones. It will raise awareness and focus attention internally within the Montgomery County government and externally to other stakeholders and members of the community at large about the challenges and opportunities presented and the potential of the IDD community in our county. It will provide a forum for advocacy and enhance communication among stakeholders uh, around this topic. And importantly, it will create a mechanism to develop new policies and programs that will support the IDD community in this county. This county is uh, rich with nonprofit organizations, civil society that's working in this issue, and this commission will bring the opportunity to bring together those folks and very specific topics to promote the interests of all the stakeholders. Thank you very much for your attention to this important project, and thank you for listening to my views. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, I know that there are more people who are going to be testifying after you, uh, but for opening up, sharing with us your personal stories and your family situations and taking time from caregiving to be with us. Uh, Councilmember Albernus. Thanks. So I love my job some moments and days more than others, um, and this is one of them. Uh, I you know, know there will be more people testifying, but I'm intimately familiar with all of your work. I've seen it. I've witnessed it. I've tried to help support it, and there is so much more to do, as Ms. Hartong said, and we look forward to doing that together. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. I just uh, also wanted to say thank you um, as a, I don't know if I'm aging, but a parent, Mm -hmm. of, uh, of an IDD, a daughter with autism, uh, I think about every day uh, what her life's going to be like and what the opportunities will be. And I really particularly want to thank you for sharing. You, you were heard today. Uh, you were, we, in, in a deeply passionate way, in your advocacy and the, your language or none of it, it was perfect English. I understood every, every, every sentence. And I uh, want to thank Councilman Robinaz and all the folks who pushed this forward. Uh, it's needed. I also want to give a just a special shout out because I missed doing it earlier to Ryan uh, Toomer in our class who is in our office who has a developmental disability and is from the SEEK program and hope to have more of those students here participating and learning about their democracy. So thank you for your advocacy and, and thank you Councilman Robinson. Uh Council Vice President Friesen. Yeah, I'll just echo the, uh, echo the thank yous. Thank you for sharing your story, and thank you to Councilmember Albernaz for your leadership on this, a longstanding effort that you have undertaken to really understand the needs uh, within this community. When, when I was at the state level, I helped to launch the ABLE program and really understood and learned the nuances within the broader disability community, that these are such nuanced challenges and issues, and the IDD community needs to have a separate venue to talk about those issues in a separate way and this effort will allow that to happen and I appreciate that the uh, broader community is supportive of this conversation as well and this will provide the space that is uh, needed there's a lot more work that we have to do uh, in this arena but uh, this is a step in the right direction an important move in the right direction uh, and this body will help us understand what is needed to be done so that we can do it so thank you very much and, and really appreciate all the leadership here councilmember albernas thanks and i just can't acknowledge enough this is co-sponsored by all colleagues um, everybody's on board on this one so we had everyone and hello thanks to you uh, so thank you i yield back to you mr president an, an easy lift from this side of the dais um, uh, thank you all for your testimony this afternoon uh, next would like to bring up uh, bob allnut 
Isabel Ising and Lori Mitchell Keller. Mr. Allnut? Is Mr. Allnut? Yeah. Uh, right down there. Perfect. There we go. You have three minutes. Hi, my name is Bob Allnut, and I'm a lifelong Montgomery County resident, and I've worked in the commercial real estate industry for over 40 years. My wife, Amy, and I live in Gaithersburg with our three children, and this is our youngest, Jack. Diagnosed with autism at age two, Jack learned to type to communicate at age 10 and was successfully mainstreamed in the Montgomery County Public School System. Now 21, Jack is going to finish up at Quince Orchard High School in June with a diploma in hand and will start at Montgomery College this summer. We applaud uh, Council Member Avanos for introducing Bill 2023 to establish the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Commission and uh, while we understand that there is no one size fits all, Jack and, and his peers would take great exception to intellectual disability um, because he's a really smart guy. As he typed the first words he typed were, I'm trying and I'm really smart. Uh, and this reminds me of the words that a self-advocate and, and artist Larry Bissonette typed in the great documentary called Regis and Jabbers. And the key phrase was, we are more like you than not. And these words ring true every day. Montgomery County is considered to be at the forefront of special needs education of children, and Jack is fortunate that we live here. But as we're finding out firsthand, as challenging as life has been getting us through high school, the rest of your life challenge is even tougher. And what's sorely needed right now is a well thought out action plan empowering IDD individuals and families to overcome their uniquely personal challenges of adulthood, especially after parents are gone. We really appreciate what you're doing here. The presumption of competence really needs to be the foundational concept of the IDD Commission, along with direct participation of the stakeholders. And to be clear, stakeholder refers to the affected individual and family, which is why I brought Jack here, so he could participate. He's 21. He's a man. So, um, you know, when we asked Jack where he wants to live when he can no longer live with us, his answer was very simple. I want to live with my friends. And who doesn't want this? And that's why we're thrilled to read the first paragraph of the IDD Commission's policy statement, which says Montgomery County is committed to creating an inclusive community for people with IDD so that they are afforded every opportunity to live a life of their choosing with the supports needed to fully participate in the county. And hallelujah, thank you, this is fantastic. Um, but creating an inclusive community is music to the ears of our group of special needs families who have for the past two years gotten together and collaborated and we created the Neighborhood of Maryland, which is a nonprofit organization with the tagline inclusive community for all abilities. We will build an inclusive community featuring a community center available to the entire county IDD community along with four purchase housing opportunities with an inclusive community which will set a template for excellence right here in Montgomery County but help and support will be needed from you on the council to make it a reality. We at the neighborhood look forward to working with the IDD Commission and the county to raise the bar for accommodating our special people who are truly more like us than not. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Jack, for being here today, and good luck over the next next few months as you graduate from QO, so congratulations. I asked him for a to make a comment, and he does type to communicate, and the only thing he said is, I just want to say that I am able. Fantastic. T H keep going. A and K thank Y O U. Thank you. F O R four H E L B I N G. Thank you for helping us. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Ms. Einzing. 
My name is Isabel Einzig. I'm the grandmother of David, who is 25 and coded with IDD. I applaud this commission. Our good news is we're now in a good place. The bad news, it took almost 20 years. As a grandparent of a young adult with IDD, I know the frustration that family members have in finding the appropriate support for these wonderful and potentially productive human beings. My background is an educator with degrees in education and applied behavioral sciences, as well as a certificate of life and leadership coach have enabled me to understand my grandson and the needs to get him the best support available, but only after much frustration and networking. David's educational journey was not adequately served in the school system from K through fifth grade. He was tested by child find at three, but little was done after that. Kindergarten through fifth grade gave us little guidance about his delayed academic development. By fifth grade, he was coded ED and put in special ed classes. All this time, David had been bullied due to his weight and difficulties with learning. After exhibiting signs of sadness and frustration, I had to intervene. I was fortunate enough that I could hire an attorney to help find the appropriate school for David since Montgomery County Schools were not meeting his needs. After meeting with the Board of Education, he was placed at the Robert Forrest School in Aspen Hill, an adjunct of Shepherd Pratt. At this time, his coding was ED, emotional disability, and I firmly disagreed with the coding, but it remained. After a few years, I met without an attorney to change his placement. I also was able to have him coded IDD at this time, thankfully. With recommendations from an educational consultant, I enrolled David in Rock Terrace School. However, this school was a highly population of children with autism, and David was not autistic. He said, Grandma, I want to go to Gaithersburg High School. My fear for David was to be in a regular population. However, with agreement from the Board of Education, he was enrolled in the LFI, Life for Independence Program. After graduating from high school with a certification and several internship experiences, David attended Montgomery College at Germantown campus, which was a public school program. Due to my networking, I found out about the Sunflower Bakery program and there he spent a year learning to be a barista while also attending the TTY program in Montgomery College. After this program ended, we were on our own. David was now 20. I investigated the DDA providers as was suggested by the teacher at TTY. TTY and applied for SSI. David was with Target, a DDA provider for several years, had life skills training and job coaching. He was also with Mars and Doors. During the pandemic, David lost interest, was not able to get a job, and eventually was asked to leave Target due to lack of participation. Scary times. I needed them. Networking led me to Zeon Parker at Doors. David was accepted into the Doors Job Coach Program. We are now in the process of getting back into DDA with Jessa. His new advocate at Mars introduced us to a man named Uji Joseph, whose company, NextGen, places and supports our children in living situations. David said he wanted to build his work confidence. He will be attending the Doors Work Training Center in Baltimore starting in April. We are now in a good place. Your newly formed commission will save time and frustration for those who need guidance. I really, really appreciate this as being a repository for all of us that need it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Isaac, uh, and shout out to Sunflower Bakery as well, among all the other uh, good organizations that have been referenced. Uh, and last on this panel is Ms. Mitchell Keller. Honorable Council Members, I'm Lori Mitchell Keller. I've been a resident of Gaithersburg in Montgomery County for 25 years. And until recently, my day job was as a global technology leader at Google. But my most important job has, and is and has always been, as a mom of three children, my middle child, Mike Keller, who has 20, who is 20 years old and has nonverbal autism. He's actually a friend of Jack's. Mike's future and opportunities are the most important thing I need to focus on, so I retired from Google to focus on the needs of Mike and the needs of those like him. My son Mike is one of the most courageous people I know he wakes up every morning with a smile on his face, knowing that everything he tries to do that day will be a challenge. This year, he will age out of the Montgomery County um, public school system and navigating the future of activities and opportunities for him will be even more challenging. I applaud Council Member Albernaz for recognizing the challenge and introducing Bill 2023 to establish an Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Commission. 
I also would respectfully like to volunteer to be on that commission as a parent um, if and when um, the opportunity arises. Adults with IDD will face many challenges in their lives. Getting a job, contributing to society, becoming an in, as independent as possible. But one of the most important parts of independence is housing. These individuals want what everyone wants. They want a place to call home where they're surrounded by friends. Hence why the neighborhood of Maryland is such an important initiative that we'll be back to talk to you about at some point. Many of these adults, as Bob Allnett mentioned, live with their parents for nearly their entire lives until their parents can no longer support them. And the housing alternatives for them after that are very limited. I believe the Commission can help navigate the housing crisis and collaborate with other organizations like the Autism Housing Network, a part of Madison House Autism Foundation, of which I'm a board member. The parents of these individuals have lots of ideas, the neighborhood of Maryland being one of them, for how to solve this housing crisis, and we hope that the council will be open to the ideas that we bring forward. Individuals with IDD have so much to offer, but for their entire lives, they will also need aids, many of them 24 by 7, to help them achieve their best. The financial burden in providing that support is more than parents can bear. Thankfully, organizations like the Autism Waiver and DDA are helping, but again, navigating these services is a huge challenge. Speaking as a mom who is currently trying to do just that. This commission will be critical in making sure adults with IDD can access the services and housing options that they so desperately need. And again, I'd be honored to be part of the commission. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you to all four of you for your testimony today. I appreciate you. Um, next, uh, we have two people who are going to be testifying virtually. The first is Mary Jane Mochi. Hi. Can we, you hear me? We see you and hear you. Thank you. Thank you for holding this meeting. Uh, however, for me and my son, it's too little, too late. My son, who is going to be 38 in June, is pretty much a zombie now. And I'm too depressed to even get out of bed most of the time. From I've been advocating for him since, almost, since he was a baby. And advocating has, is frustrating because hasn't done anything. I'm sorry you all listen, but nobody does anything. We need power. Will this commission have power? I would like to see had give us power of people actually do things. My son ha has is a horrible job. He 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 doesn't have a regular work schedule. They fit him around everybody else, even though he's the, been there the longest. He's been seven years in his job that they don't give him never given him a regular work schedule, and they think because he can drive there and he has worked for seven years that he doesn't have DD. DD or whatever, but then they say, well, he has, in both of us, mental illness, he has severe depression. They say, the last time we had a hearing at the DDA, they were very rude and said, well, we're not going to help you because he has mental illness, and we think that's the main reason he's having problems. Uh, come on, he has both of them. He has autism and... <clears throat> depression come on you can have both they the dda and door should both be investigated i'm sorry i've been very frustrated and i can hardly think i've been fighting with them since i applied to dda in 2003 2003 and my son will be 38 in june what's the problem and he's he's black too and you you all talk low income black you all just care about seeing most of the people get help or people who are well off enough to hire lawyers and we can't i have finally found a pro bono lawyer but she's not been able to accomplish anything much so thank you he really 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 he's obese and and he's a hoarder. He buys things he doesn't need, and it's all over the house. It's a mess. It's it's like my mother, would, late mother, would say, "It's a pigsty here." I'm sorry. He doesn't know how to organize things. He has poor executive functioning. 
and I'm going to be 78 tomorrow. And, and it's a woman's issue. It's International Women's Day. This is a woman's issue. We are the ones, primary caregivers of these of people with ID and DD. We are the ones who bear the burden. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Jane. Uh, next is Geneva Burroughs Stone. Uh, hello. Um, can you hear me? We see you and hear you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so I'm here to support Bill 1023. My son, Rob Stone, who lives in Bethesda, by the way, is an artist and advocate who has lived in Montgomery County all 25 years of his life. He has become a respected advocate on Capitol Hill and in Annapolis, and he has his own art website. Due to his rare disease and developmental disabilities, Rob is a wheelchair user, has a tracheostomy and a J-tube, and uses assistive technology to communicate because he is non-speaking. Despite these challenges, Rob leads an active and happy life. He has this beautiful life because his parents fought long and hard against both county and state entities that had only low expectations of him. I support the establishment of an IDD commission because it will help the county council establish bridges among families, county disability providers, hopefully the public schools, and state government to create better policy and change attitudes. My family first experienced discrimination when Rob entered MCDS. We were told when Rob was in first grade that indicating yes or no might be all the communication skills Rob ever needed. I was told Rob's toileting was more important than his math skills. The PPA wouldn't allocate funding to special education classrooms. The principal of Rob's elementary school told special education parents that other families were afraid of our children. MCPS offered Rob only a de minimis education. They never put any effort into helping him learn to read. And what MCPS leaves undone is only passed along as additional expense to the county and to the state. At transition, we discovered there were no inclusive providers, county providers, that would consider Rob because of his complex disabilities and medical needs. We turned to self-direction, but neither the county nor the state will provide the support Rob needs to live in his community long term. He is slated to be sent to a nursing facility when my husband and I are considered too feeble to care for him. We are terrified. Furthermore, there are other problems. County sports programs cannot serve Rob due to his medical and other support needs. County respite care has never been available to us because Rob is fortunate to be enrolled in two state programs, but neither one allows their funds to be used for respite care. So my husband and I can't go out and do anything together. The council needs to know that a new generation of families has much higher expectations for their disabled children with complex medical, behavioral, and communication needs, as well as developmental disabilities. We are the ADA generation. We're not satisfied with current county transition offerings or with attitudes at MCPS. Please enact this commission. We can all work together to ensure better community inclusion for wonderful people like Rob. Thank you so much for all of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Stone. Thank you again for everybody taking the time out of your schedule to come in and testify today. Um, this might be the easiest piece of legislation that we're going to pass uh, since it has unanimous support due to the dutiful work of Councilmember Albernaz. I do have two colleagues who want to make a comment. First, Councilmember Mink. Thank you. Um, I first wanted to thank everyone who testified today. As was noted by the council president, um, we are uh, excited to, to pass this unanimously and, and move this forward and, and support this initiative. That said, every testimony today was so important for us to hear. And um, I, I just really appreciate all of you for sharing your stories. They're very impactful. Um, these are conversations that we need to be having in this room more often. And, um, and I think that's why Councilmember Albernaz has spearheaded this effort. And I, am, and I know I share the sentiments of my colleagues here that, that we are glad to know that we will now have the added mandate and the added capacity that the commission will bring to move forward the important real legislative and policy work and changes 
um, that all of you have, have discussed here today. So thank you all so much for sharing your stories. Um, again, although we are set to pass this unanimously, I want to emphasize how critically important it is um, for you to have shared your voices and your stories. It will impact you know, the changes and the policy movements that we make moving forward. And it's just so important, again, to have uh, these stories and your voices here um, in, in these halls of power, and, and Jack, especially to you. Uh, thank you so much for being here, um, for sharing your story with us. Um, you are smart and capable, and uh, we look forward to, to moving this commission forward and, and helping to do everything we can to set you up to, to do everything that you want and deserve to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Member Mink. Next, Council Member Balcom. Thank you. Uh, uh, my colleague, Councilmember Mink, said it so eloquently. So thank you all. I do uh, want to thank Councilmember Albernos for bringing this uh, forward. The testimony that we heard today from the very strong advocates really underscores the, the need to, for this commission, and uh, we, we all support this commission. I do want to just highlight Jalen Prince is in the audience today from um, Madison House Autism Foundation in beautiful District 2, uh, so thank you for your service. And I just also, from the testimony of Ms. Uh, Mitchell, uh, Mitchell uh, Keller, uh, so we will be looking for uh, individuals to fill this commission. So I count on the strong, strong advocates that we've heard from today and the entire uh, uh, community to make sure that, that we we get this commission up and running and we will be lo uh, looking for uh, the, the passion and the strength that we've heard today. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, this public hearing is now closed. Next, colleagues, we're going to move to the semi-annual report by the Maryland, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. Presentations by our planning department, our parks department. And before we, we get started, uh, I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of the entire council to Sheree Branson, David Hill, and Amy Presley. Yeah, I see Mr. Hill here. Hi. Um, uh, for taking the last few months to serve on the planning board when the community really needed you. Uh, and last week, uh, we appointed James Hedrick. Mitra Penwim and Sean Bartley to the planning board. I believe they were sworn in yesterday. Uh, so they are officially commissioners of the uh, Park and Planning Commission. Uh, we look forward to seeing them at, at, future, uh, at future conversations. Um, but we are excited about the future of the planning board. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Zients. Yep. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Jeff Zients. I'm chair of the uh, planning board. Uh, I, I don't use the term interim because I don't think anybody wants an interim plat. Uh, when I sign those plats, they, they need to be there forever. So if you'll excuse me for not using that term. Uh, I am here today in an unusual position of really telling you what the planning board itself did. The people who first came on November 2nd and we're there through March 2nd. It's four months. It gives you some idea of the regulatory activity that's going on and what the county can expect in the future. If you, you can put on the slide, if you, oh, it's up to them. Uh, um, you can, oh, you can't see, but what we've done is uh, have an extraordinary number of plans uh, come before the full board. In total, it's 133 total plans. A lot of them were things that would have been handled in the consent agenda before. 
but we don't do consent agendas anymore. We take votes on everything and allow things for public hearing with every item we do. So that includes uh, record plats, forest conservation, exemptions, extensions, and, and those things. More importantly to the, to the county are the new things that have come in, those, those pieces of ground that did not have entitlements before. And there are 14 of those in various categories. It's a, we run a complicated process because you can do some things both at the same time. So you can do a preliminary plan and a, a sketch plan and a preliminary plan, a preliminary plan and a site plan. And so I wanted to uh, make sure we did not double count in what we were saying. But still, in four months, we approved 350,000 square feet of, of new commercial space and, and about 1,400 dwelling units with, with 200 MPDUs. Uh, not bad, but what's the more significant numbers were really in the amendments, because we had some big amendments, including the Davis Tract, where you're dealing with a million square feet of development in, in one plan. Uh, and in total, in amendments, we dealt with uh, 3,800 dwelling units. Uh, so pretty significant numbers. But that's only the regulatory side that this board uh, did. We reviewed a whole number of master plans, a whole number of studies. Our work will soon be your work. Um, you will be getting the rustic road plan that, that we went through uh, public hearings and work sessions and delivered a, a draft to you. Uh, you will, we are just starting on the pedestrian uh, master plan, which is an extraordinary piece of work will be, that will be the subject of public hearing uh, on March 23rd. Um, uh, we review the climate assessment tools that we will be using to uh, fulfill one of the council's mandate to worry about that as we propose legislation or review legislation. And of course, the first thing we did is, might be the last thing that I do, which was our budget. Uh, within two weeks of our coming down, we had to approve a budget, we, which then th went through the full commission and finally gets up here. We, it now went to the executive, it'll come to this body, and, and we will look for your support in that uh, by the end of May. And that's about my term. Uh, uh, you know, I expect uh, to uh, be joyfully replaced uh, in mid-June or something like that, and that is fine and appropriate for me. I thank you for the opportunity to be here, but uh, here is once is enough for, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, for the semi-annual. Now, with, with that, it, it's uh, my pleasure to now let the two departments tell you what they've done. First, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Tanya Stern. And, and Ms. Stern, before you begin, let me just let colleagues know that we'll receive both presentations by planning and park, and, and then we will engage in Q&A. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. I am Tanya Stern, Acting Planning Director. Uh, although I've been attending semi-annual reports for as long as I've worked with the planning department, this is my first one in this role. Uh, so I appreciate this opportunity to share the great work we've been doing over the last uh, several months. Next slide. So I want to start with Thrive Montgomery 2050. Now that Thrive is adopted, our focus is now on implementation. Working with our uh, colleagues in public agencies and the private sector, uh, to make sure that we implement uh, the recommendations that you all have adopted. It is important to note two key things about Thrive. The first is that it is a high-level policy document. It is a roadmap that will guide future planning efforts, future public uh, uh, decisions on uh, capital projects, uh, future public amenities, as well as uh, guiding private development. So that is really the role of a general plan. It is a policy document. It is not a tactical, you know, you must, you are required to do X, Y, and Z. That is not its role. The other key thing to note is that as a general plan, it is going to be implemented over multiple decades. That is why it says Thrive Montgomery 2050, not Thrive Montgomery 2030. 
So there will be many opportunities for the community and others to weigh in on all the various ways that this plan is going to be um, implemented over the coming decades. A foundational premise of Thrive is creating equitable and complete communities. As you all may know, equity is one of the three pillars of Thrive, and it is absolutely necessary for the future, the present and future success of this county. Next slide. So let me talk a bit about complete communities. There's a whole chapter in Thrive about this concept, which is about providing a mix of housing and community amenities, services, jobs, transportation options in close proximity to where our residents live. There is this notion built into it of a 15 minute living. And the idea is that our residents should be able to access all these different important aspects of living in this county in close proximity again of where they live. So they don't have to drive across the county to access these amenities. Another important thing to keep in mind about complete communities is that there, there is not a one size fits all approach to what complete communities will look like. As we all know, Montgomery County is very diverse, not only in its residents, but also in its context. We have urban areas, traditional suburban areas, rural areas, but all of those communities are opportunities to have complete communities. Next slide. So one thing that our department really actually hasn't talked to this council about very much is a very important initiative that we have had underway uh, formally since 2020 and that is our equity and planning agenda. The foundation for this actually started uh, earlier than when the council adopted the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act in the fall of 2019. Uh, when I joined the department in 2018, uh, we already had an internal working group looking at how we can make equity a foundational part of our work. We also worked on a number of plans, including the Beers Mill Corridor Plan, which <laughs> Council Member Fanny Gonzalez worked on when she was on the planning board, where we use uh, a number of different strategies to make sure that we engage equitably with our community members. So I wanted to just touch on very briefly on this slide, and then I'm gonna walk through some uh, specific examples after this on how we have been uh, implementing this effort. We have a number of ongoing efforts, one of which is very broadly called applying the equity lens for master plans. That is a very sort of high level catch all for how we look at equity when we produce our master plans through looking at existing conditions, looking at the data of communities, looking at the history of those communities, looking at what amenities, resources are lacking in particular communities, and then coming up with strategies to fill those needs. We also have a number of uh, different strategies that we use to engage equitably with the community, and I'll talk about that in a bit. We also have an internal equity peer review group, which I will also touch on. We also require annual uh, equity training for all of our employees, whether they are professional planners or not. We also have completed a number of different tools, particularly around data. Um, and again, I will touch on some of these in the next uh, few slides. Uh, equity focus areas mapping, trends in racial and ethnic diversity, a neighborhood change analysis in the DC region, and a mapping segregation project, uh, which will be coming to the council uh, shortly. And then we also have a couple of other initiatives underway, an Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Report uh, Project and a Community Equity Index, which will be uh, rolling out very shortly. Next slide. So I wanted to talk a bit about the equity focus areas data tool. This is a tool we rolled out uh, probably almost a couple of years now. And this is, uh, it's a Montgomery County tailored variation of a tool that was created by the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. They called it the equity emphasis areas. Um, and I believe uh, county agencies are tasked with using that. We came up with this tool, um, again, focused particularly on Montgomery County and it shows uh, areas of the county that are majority uh, low income, people of color, and residents who speak English less than very well. And uh, the map of the, the EFAs are shown on the slide. And as you can see from some of the data, you know, this is an opportunity for us to look at you know, how well these residents stand with regards to uh, the county as a whole and these important metrics such as household income, for example. Next slide. So this is an example of how we actually apply the equity focus areas map. Uh, as uh, Chair Zayas mentioned, uh, the planning board is just about to start their work with the pedestrian master plan. Uh, the public hearing draft is already, is already publicly available. One of the things that the team did uh, for this plan 
was to apply the EFA's uh, map layer in looking at crash data, pedestrian crash data, and to identify whether or not those uh, particular metrics were worse or better or the same um, compared to other parts of the county. And as you can see, uh, I pulled out uh, a screenshot or a snapshot from one of the tables in the uh, draft plan that uh, some of these uh, pedestrian crash metrics are worse in EFAs. And so that is something that we need to be particularly mindful of as we develop recommendations. Next slide. Another data tool that we rolled out recently uh, is a GIS story map, Trends in Racial and Ethnic Diversity for Montgomery County. This is um, a tool that walks through how the county has changed uh, in terms of race and ethnicity in our resident population between 1990 and 2020. If you haven't taken a look at it, I highly recommend that you dig into it. There's a lot of data. Um, it really tells a very detailed story about how the county has changed over these last few decades. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, we have an internal equity peer review group. Their role is to support the implementation of equity and master planning. They essentially serve as a, another set of eyes uh, and minds to help think through how we can integrate equity into our planning work. So they meet regularly with project managers of our master plans uh, to provide feedback on draft recommendations, planning policies, community engagement strategies. Um, another uh, one thing I forgot to mention um, in terms of the 2020 start date of this initiative, that was when our department produced a framework document around our equity agenda and planning that laid out uh, several action items, and one of which was to create this equity peer review group. This group is both diverse in terms of demographics, but also in terms of their planning expertise. Uh, so we have uh, master planners, transportation planners, environmental planners, et cetera. Next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about how we do equitable engagement. Um, I'm just gonna show you a couple of examples of how we've done this uh, with two master plans. Uh, the first is a Fairland and Briggs Cheney master plan. Uh, which again, oh, no, we haven't talked about it yet, but that's gonna be coming to the planning board very soon, so stay tuned. Uh, but we did a number of different things to engage with this very, very diverse community that is predominantly black, both African-American and uh, black immigrants from African countries and elsewhere. Uh, one thing I did wanna note is that uh, coming out of the pandemic, you know, obviously we had to shift to doing virtual engagement during that time. And as we all know, that is a great way for more residents to be engaged. It is our standard practice now, um, even though we do hold in-person community meetings, we do both in-person and virtual meetings for all of our master plans. So whenever there's an in-person meeting, there's a virtual one um, that's coming along right after that. So we did that for this plan. Uh, we also worked uh, with an artist as a way to capture residents' ideas and visions for their community um, in a very different way. So there's an example of that on the screen. We also translate a lot of materials, whether they are explainer documents, uh, surveys, uh, postcards to get folks engaged. Um, and we also use canvassers uh, for this community. We worked with a canvassing company to go to knock on people's doors in multifamily buildings and to go straight to them to ask them about their ideas, their concerns about their communities. Next slide. Another project I wanted to highlight in terms of equitable engagement is the Tacoma Park Minor Master Plan Amendment. Uh, again, we also use uh, a canvassing company uh, to work with us on this. And one thing I wanted to highlight is that in addition to capturing um, the residents' ideas about what their concerns or um, sort of opportunities for improvements are, we made sure to actually capture the demographic data of the residents that we spoke to, and we in turn compared that, compare that to the demographic data of that community. And that is a good way for us to check to make sure that we are actually reaching a representative uh, sort of portion of the community in this engagement. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, uh, through our historic preservation team, we have an Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage uh, project that we launched, one of which includes a kind of a crowdsource uh, uh, interactive map where we ask residents to identify places that they think might be important cultural resources that we should consider. Um, you know, the basic premise behind this project is that you know, even though we have a historic preservation master plan, we've got the locational atlas, we have a number of efforts 
to celebrate and recognize this county's history, we're very lacking on recognizing the Asian American history of this uh, county. And so this project is a way for us to start to fill that gap. And uh, in addition, we also completed the first phase of the mapping segregation project. This is an effort um, that our team undertook with some consultant assistance to look at uh, deeds of residential properties in a down county part of the county, which is essentially inside the Beltway, to identify um, if uh, racially restrictive uh, covenants existed, and if so, where. And so this map uh, shows those areas in red. Uh, again, this is an, another resource that I recommend the uh, council members and community members go to our website to explore further. Next slide. So shifting to master plans, uh, we have a lot of master plans and other projects underway. Uh, as uh, Chair Zayas noted, we recently completed work with the board on the Rustic Roads Functional Master Plan, so that has been transmitted to the council. We uh, also, with the board's... The other one's transmitted. Yes, so I was just about to get to that. Uh, the uh, other one that we also recently uh, completed um, in terms of getting the board's comments on is the uh, amendments to the Historic Preservation Master Plan for two sites in the county. Um, we also are just starting the board process for the pedestrian master plan, as Chair Zions noted, and the board will shortly be receiving the Fairland and Briggs Cheney Master Plan. And then we have several other master plans and projects underway. The Tacoma Park uh, plan that I mentioned, the Great Seneca plan, the University Boulevard Corridor Plan is one we just launched in November. We also are just getting started on the incentive density guidelines update. That is an opportunity for us to look at the bonus point system to make sure that we have the right set of priorities in terms of looking for uh, community amenities um, for which uh, projects can get, um, if they provide it, can get some uh, additional density. And then we're also just kicking off the Friendship Heights Urban Design Study. Next slide. We have two master plans that we'll, we will be launching um, this fiscal year, the Clarksburg master plan as well as the Silver Springs communities uh, plan. Next slide. So I want to shift to a uh, development review, which is the other sort of important function of our department. I uh, wanted to highlight in particular the development review committee that uh, my department is uh, charged with leading, um, and that includes multiple county um, as well as state agencies. We held a retreat uh, in fall of last year um, with the development community to talk about uh, ways in which we can expedite and, and improve, improve the process, particularly with regards to the development review committee's um, involvement. And one of the most significant changes we made um, after this uh, retreat was uh, developing a work session that now occurs a week after the Development Review Committee meetings with applicants where any un unresolved issues can be hashed out. And that way we can enable the uh, applicants to submit their plans within a time frame that's required to avoid delays. Next slide. So just uh, to talk a bit about the development review process, uh, as Chair Zayas noted, there are sort of three different types of plans that will come to the board for uh, development applications, sketch plans, preliminary plans, and site plans. They each have uh, required timeframes um, in order to complete the reviews, um, as noted on the slide. Uh, but there are uh, initiatives that we have been um, undertaking to expedite that process. Of one of which is uh, something that Chair Zion has noted earlier, concurrent application reviews and board approval, so bringing sketch plans and preliminary plans together at the same time, which cuts out a lot of time. We have the speed to market initiative uh, that we worked on, uh, particularly for um, strategic economic development projects and other priority projects, the biohealth priority campus review process, uh, which we thank um, Council Member Friedson leadership on. One thing I wanted to note, the time frame is not 90 days, it's 60 to 65 days. Uh, but again, that's, that is an opportunity for us to uh, get these projects through the review process faster. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about the um, projects that our um, area teams have reviewed and have taken to the planning board. Uh, Chair Zayas kind of talked about the, uh, the projects that went through uh, this most recent iteration of the board. This data is really looking, going all the way back to the beginning of this fiscal year, so July of 2022 through uh, the end of uh, February. Our down county planning team reviewed uh, 1.1 million square feet of total development. That includes over 1,200 residential units, including uh, 271 MPGUs, 
and uh, we got through the shortest planning board review within 64 days. Next slide. Our Mid-County Planning Division reviewed, uh, they're very busy, they reviewed uh, uh, 2.7 million square feet of total development, um, including over 2,300 residential units uh, and over 300 uh, MPDUs, and their shortest review time was 48 days. Next slide. And then for our up-county team, uh, one uh, site correction, the, uh, they reviewed uh, almost 114,000 square feet of commercial, and then the rest that is listed under commercial, that was actually uh, almost uh, 600,000 square feet of multifamily senior residential. Um, and then in addition, they also reviewed projects with uh, 340 residential units, including 60 MPDUs, and their shortest review time was 79 days. Next slide. I want to talk a little bit about a couple of other special projects that we have underway. They're really not projects, but more initiatives. One is Reforest Montgomery. Um, this includes a number of different efforts that we have to make sure that our county uh, ha is more green in terms of more um, enhancing and improving and increasing the tree canopy, as well as protecting and, and uh, uh, reforesting parts of our county. I have some data from FY22 um, in terms of what we've been able to accomplish. There were uh, 793 trees planted across all Reforest Montgomery projects and almost seven acres reforested uh, by Mag uh, Reforest Montgomery through plantings. Um, just to, um, also just wanted to note that in terms of FY23 to date, uh, we've reforested or helped to reforest five acres and expect um, another four acres to be reforested by the end of this fiscal year. And uh, we've also, uh, we also have a, an, an effort where residents can uh, apply for free trees um, to be uh, planted on their properties. And so um, for FY22, we planted 98 free trees on pro private properties. And to date in FY23, we have planted um, excuse me, going back to fall of 2022, we planted 53 free trees and expect to plant another uh, 50 trees this spring. We have a sort of a fall and spring planting season. Next slide. We also have a very robust uh, placemaking initiative that we've had underway for a number of years. Uh, I wanted to highlight um, an effort that we did just last fall, which was part of doing more creative engagement with our community members, um, as well as looking at how we can re-envision uh, a, a very, uh, basically a parking lot. That's part of the uh, parking ride area in the Fairland and Bridge Cheney area. We did a weekend long, play, weekend long placemaking festival where we worked with multiple county agencies and other partners to basically transform essentially a parking lot um, into an area with lots of amenities for community members uh, to come and have fun. We also use that as a way to make sure we talked about the master plan and, and to get residents' um, perspectives. This is just one example of the types of projects that we've been doing through our placemaking initiative, but we're looking at how we can do placemaking um, even better and in, in, in different ways that we haven't done before. And so we are actually in the process of creating a strategic plan uh, to help inform that. Next slide. And then I want to, um, just end on um, just highlighting another initiative that we've held that we've had underway for a number of years, and that is Design Excellence. And as part of that, we co-host a biannual Design Excellence Awards. The next one is coming up this October, October 19th. It will be held in our Wheaton headquarters building. I know uh, some council members attended the event in 2021, so we wanted to put this on your radar to save the date and hope that you can join us. Um, at that event. And uh, that concludes my presentation, but I wanted to um, note uh, before I get to the work program schedule, uh, I was here during uh, some of the testimony for the, um, the Intellectual and Developmental D Disabilities Commission legislation, and one of the witnesses talked about a project that would, that's really about housing and um, neighborhoods. And uh, I gave him my card before he left. Uh, but I wanted to mention that Thrive Montgomery 2050 has a policy that speaks to integrating housing for uh, residents with disabilities along that could be affordable and has the services that they need. So I wanted to just make sure that you all were aware of that. 
So we have uh, provided um, to council staff and it's in your, pa your packet an updated work program schedule. And with that, I conclude my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. I'm just happy to know that part of design excellence is wearing sneakers with the suits. Um, <laughs> Record. I'm dwelling on that statement, right? <laughs> Seeing what, thinking what I'm missing or, or, or not. Uh, Director Riley. Okay, are we ready to hear about the parks? <laughs> ready? Excellent. Uh, I'll just start while the slides are getting up with uh, thanking you for allowing us to grace your walls of your hearing rooms with these lovely images of our parks and facilities. We hope to keep that going. So thank you very much. Uh, my opening slide here is uh, drone footage from the uh, 2022 Germantown Glory Fireworks at South Germantown uh, Regional Park. We're proud to host this event each year uh, in partnership with the county's recreation department. I just point that out specifically for <laughs> council member uh, Alvin House because that department does most of the work to put these on, but we're pleased to be the host. Uh, one of our biggest events in our parks, uh, we estimated attendance around 30,000 uh, last year, making it one of the largest events we host. Uh, I'm going to be talking in some of my future slide about our efforts and the importance of our expert, our efforts to expand community events like this in our parks. We want people in our parks. And I will note that the county's uh, other main fireworks event, Wheaton Sparkles, uh, is hosted in Newport Mill Local Park adjacent to uh, Einstein High School with attendance estimated at about 15,000 last year. Next. Uh, so uh, knowing there's always going to be incredible pressure on you and fierce competition for geo bonds and other uh, local funding, we do aggressively pursue state and federal grants to support our park capital project. I want to thank our Montgomery County delegation of the General Assembly and our Maryland uh, my, our Maryland congressional delegation for consistently supporting us in addition to the council over the last few years. This 15 million is actual uh, grants we received in 2022. We've been equally aggressive uh, this year uh, with our state and federal uh, grant applications uh, and we were thrilled to be notified just in February that we were awarded a seven and a half million safe streets for all grant which is part of the federal infrastructure and investment jobs act that is going to go a long way to helping us meet our vision zero goals we do have a trail network of over 200 miles that crosses public streets at over 200 locations and unfortunately we have had incidents so those uh, trails and intersections need to be improved uh, we hope to be back to you shortly after the general assembly wraps up with more good news about state money and throughout my presentation you see asterisks and double asterisks and asterisk uh, means the project is within an equity focus area that director stern uh, explained that uh, joint effort to map those areas based on certain demographics and the double asterisk means that it's adjacent to or serving an equity focus area so you can see we do prioritize our investment in those communities next uh, we have a long-range plan to evolve the uh, future of the park system to continue to meet the need of our growing and changing community. It's called the Park Recreation and Open Space Plan, or the PROS Plan. Uh, in my humble opinion, the plan the board just approved in June 22 is the most uh, robust plan we've ever done, driven by extensive community outreach. The plan has many goals uh, for the future of the parks, but at the highest level, it stresses encouraging physical activity. Uh, facilitating social interaction in our public spaces and protecting our environment. So you're going to see those themes in many of my slides today. We did recently brief the Parks uh, Housing, and, uh, excuse me, the Planning, Housing and Parks Committee on that plan and received great feedback. And if you don't already have a copy of the plan, please let me know and I will get you one. Uh, moving down a level on the park master plan level, uh, the board uh, in June 22 approved an update to the Wheaton Regional Park uh, master plan. Again, after robust community input, uh, Wheaton Regional Park was created in the 1960s. It now spans over 500 acres, hosts a variety of amenities, including the miniature train and carousel, the athletic complex, ice rinks, Brookside, extensive trail network, and more. Uh, one of the downsides of this great park is that it is accessed by vehicles from three different public streets. Uh, the athletic complex and ice rink from Orabaugh Ave off Arcola, uh, the train and carousel from Shorefield off Georgia Avenue, 
and then Brookside Gardens and Nature Center by Glenn Allen. So one of the premier recommendations of this plan is to provide improved pedestrian and bicycle access both to uh, all these amenities in the park and then uh, within the different pods in the park. And we are already implementing some of the trail recommendations uh, today. And another recommendation, a primary recommendation, is to add trending amenities to this older park consistent with our pros goals, promoting physical activity and social engagement. So that takes me to the next slide. Uh, primary recommendation is a uh, Wheaton, a world-class adventure sports complex. In addition to the athletic area, we envision this as a regional destination that offers something for all ages and skill levels, a place where kids or families can spend the better part of a day. Uh, we have already received two and a half million dollars in state funding for the project and are going to enter into the design phase soon. And one global point I'll make here and in a few other slides uh, that we've really strived for is to reduce the amount of time between planning a project and implementing a project. Uh, extended project timelines uh, produce so many multiple challenges and problems, and we're proud that we're uh, drastically reducing the time frame from uh, uh, planning to cutting the ribbon uh, on our park projects. Next. So over the last five plus or minus years, we've been promoting or facilitating an increasing number of events in our parks that bring people together of common interests. These events cater to diverse interests, ranging from salsa in the park, skate nights, comedy nights, acoustic snails, and then annual events like the MoCo Epic, the Parks Half Marathon, and the Long Branch Festival. Uh, attendance typically exceeds expectations, uh, showing that there's a pent-up demand for outdoor uh, community particular uh, activities. Uh, basically, if you bring a band, a food truck, and a local craft beer vendor to one of our parks, uh, people show up in droves. The numbers uh, are kind of mind-boggling. Our comedy nights, which were new last year, brought 780 participants. A uh, event called the Parks Ale Trail, which was a hike around Lake, the shores of Lake Needwood, brought uh, 1,500 people. We're repeating that again this Saturday. We did a one-off about the Rocky Horror Picture Show and showed a movie that was 500 attendees. So attendance at these events, uh, you know, is, is just uh, absolutely incredible, and we are going to keep uh, doing more. Next. Here's a very interesting one called the Color and Kite Festival. We host at Black Hill Regional Park each year. It's an event organized by the Maryland Premier Cricket League to celebrate what is called Holi. Holi has been celebrated in the Indian subcontinent for centuries. It marks the beginning of spring after a long winter and symbolic of the triumph of good over evil. Uh, 2022 attendance was around 3,000 people. Uh, and the sixth annual event will be held Sunday, April 23rd, uh, 2023, from 11 to 6. I plan to attend, and it's really a spectacle that is worth stopping by and paying a visit. This is a busy slide I'll not ask you to really look at. It highlights our capital project de delivery since the fall of 22 uh, through 2024. Uh, it's basically just to show we are delivering projects. We never uh, slowed down. I'll just highlight a few here. Finally, we're going to be thrilled to be opening Gene Lynch Urban Park in downtown Silver Spring. Uh, in the next few months, it's a park being built by the county's Department of General Services, and we're 99% done. Uh, we're renovating uh, an athletic field inside the track at Blair High School to uh, make that field available for community use. That will open up this spring. Uh, we are uh, going to also be shortly opening up a seed classroom in uh, Black Hill Regional Park. It's a net zero classroom to provide nature and environmental programming that we got a state grant uh, for. And then another big one, Hillendale Local Park in White Oak, a complete park redo, a major investment we hope to have open this summer with all new facilities for that community. Uh, the term park refresher is a relatively new term in our vocabulary. It gets back to that issue of trying to move faster and spread the uh, investment around uh, more equitably. It's our effort to implement meaningful improvements to our older community parks in a condensed time frame and affordable budget. We use factors such as facility condition assessments, needs analysis, and equity focus areas to determine uh, priorities, uh, again, you see a lot of asterisks there indicating the tilt towards the EFAs or EFA serving areas. And then the two photos, the one on the left is a refresher we comp completed 
recently in a tiny park called uh, Edith Rockmorton Park in Kengar. And then to the right is a park we're uh, completing design in, uh, Carol Knowles Park uh, on George Ave between Silver Spring and Wheaton. And the primary feature there is going to be a pump track and a bike skills park. And we are very thrilled that that local community is excited and supportive of an active amenity like that in their community park. Next, please. Uh, we've launched a unique initiative to look simultaneously at needed improvements to a system of eight older parks serving the Long Branch community. We're in the midst of an extensive community outreach process, including intercept surveys, focus groups, and door-to-door -door canvassing, and more. Uh, some of the projects are in a design phase, while others are in a planning phase, and we expect to take recommendations for improvements to all eight parks to the planning board uh, this summer. Uh, so we've been really working for about three years now on this project about how to measure park visitation uh, utilizing trending technology. Uh, it's always been easy for us to obtain usage data for fee-based facilities like our ice rinks and summer camps, but a little more challenging for the uh, outdoor events uh, and the free programs. Uh, and, and visitation data is obviously important to us for a variety of reasons, including uh, prioritizing capital investment and measuring the success of programs and uh, projects. We're working with two companies, one's called Streetlight Data and the other is called City Data that measure visitation through crowdsourced uh, mobile device data. Well, the, the uh, technology is not perfect. Uh, the data they've provided us so far would indicate that there is an 80% increase in visitation across the entire park system between March 2020 when the uh, uh, pandemic began and when we peaked uh, in, in January 22. I wouldn't uh, hold this as gospel, but it does comport with other observations like our trail counters, our manual counting we do at the, uh, the act activation events and then other anecdotal data. Next, athletic fields. Uh, we continue to invest in improving athletic fields in our parks and at MCPS school sites is a big priority. We manage 290 athletic fields in the parks and also at 103 of the elementary and middle schools. Uh, here are a couple before and after pictures of park renovations that kind of speak for themselves. Uh, we've drastically advanced our expertise, equipment, and staffing to build and sustain high quality natural grass athletic fields over the last decade thanks to additional resources provided to us by the County Council. Uh, here's a before and after picture of a school field we renovated last summer at Highland Elementary School in Wheaton with an appreciative uh, note we got from uh, the school principal. There are still 24 schools that are not in our program and at current funding levels it's going to take nearly six years to get all the elementary and middle schools under our care. Uh, the fields that are not under our care are generally in very poor condition and MCPS will acknowledge they get little to no uh, maintenance and then of course after we get all the schools in the program we will need dedicated life cycle funding to go back to the 127 schools that have highly used fields that may need uh, a refresher. And I just want to point the upgraded fields at schools not only provide better outdoor space for the students and athletes of the school during the school year we then get to permit them for leagues and community use on the weekends and evenings which helps us meet our demand for fields particularly in key high desired uh, communities and locations. This is a program I'm incredibly excited about. We piloted a trail ambassador program last summer. Nine teenagers graduated from the program in July after spending two weeks helping us build and maintain natural surface trails in our parks uh, and uh, with breaks to learn how to ride mountain bikes on our trails. Uh, for the hard work, the participants received a free mountain bike. Uh, and a certificate at a graduation uh, ceremony. The mountain bikes, obviously a big uh, incentive for their participants, were made possible through funding from the Montgomery Parks Foundation. They're doing that again this year, so I want to thank them. We plan to continue and expand the program. And each of the students, this was kind of a surprise, they all chose to speak at the graduation when we asked them how it went and some of the common comments across the board where I didn't know about all these trails in our parks. I love learning how to ride a mountain bike. I made new friends and I plan to continue biking and tell my friends about it. So this program is going to go places. Uh, Fairland Bike Park, we cut the ribbon on the pit, a new bike park in Fairland Recreational Park last year. It's a bike skills park with features uh, for residents 
uh, for, excuse me, for riders at all skill levels from beginner to expert. Uh, the trail map uh, resembles a ski slope map with uh, loops color-coded from green to black diamond. Uh, it was an old gravel pit that had been formally used as a bike park for years, uh, and the project was made possible by a $100,000 bond bill from uh, the state of Maryland. And again, it's a representative of our efforts to promote uh, physical activities and having facilities that meet uh, in all different interest levels. Uh, another focus for us over the last decade has been assuring access to our parks and programs for people of all abilities. We've invested millions in physical improvements to enable access to meet the requirements of the ADA and have also built a program access team to provide accommodations to anyone who may need them to access our facilities, our programs. In addition to providing accommodations to hundreds of residents, two of the projects this team uh, led last year were a mural at Wheaton Regional Park during Autism Acceptance Aware Awareness Month. The mural was created by Justin Valenti, a Gaithersburg resident and digital and visual artist who is on the autism spectrum uh, and now is one of my best friends on Twitter. Uh, you can see that a lot of the current and council members attended that lovely event, so you got to witness it. And uh, the second photo is a new program called Montgomery Explorers. It's an organized walking club designated for residents uh, age 50 and better. Uh, it serves a rapidly growing demographic in Montgomery County. Uh, it's for all uh, level fitness levels and abilities. And uh, the Explorers have walked uh, 66 walks since the program's inception in April 2021 with an average of 40 attendees. Uh, per walk, and while the program was initiated by my program access team, I'm pleased to say it is now mostly run by volunteers who participated in the initial program, showing how strong the support is. So changing topics entirely, uh, we're working closely with our partners at the Maryland Department of Agriculture to educate ourselves to prepare to uh, very likely be inundated by the spotty, spotted lanternfly this year. This is a non-native insect native to Eastern Asia that was first detected in Pennsylvania in 2014 and has since invaded 14 states in the US. The, US. the good news, this is not a insect that stings or bite. It is a sap feeder that particular attracted to an invasive plant tree of heaven. So we, we like that part of it. Uh, but it will also feed on other uh, na native trees, plants, and crops. Uh, we learned a lot from our neighbors in Pennsylvania and been dealing with this for a number of years. It's helped to form our response, which for parks is currently focused on training staff to identify the various life stages uh, of the lanternfly and report sightings to the state. Uh, we're working on developing information to engage and inform the public about the bug because it appears anywhere near uh, the masses you see on that tree there. We are going to have some freaked out residents, so we'll be ready to answer questions. Uh, we're not considering any kind of widespread treatment for the lanternfly, but we will continue to monitor and assess uh, its development. Uh, Montgomery Parks is tackling climate change by reducing emissions within our operations through electrification of our equipment and fleet, generation of solar energy on parkland, and retrofitting facilities to be more efficient. Uh, we've signed contracts recently for three new solar arrays on rooftops of our maintenance facilities that we intend to generate 239,000 kilowatts of clean energy. Uh, we currently generate 3.2 million kilowatts of clean energy on parkland, which covers about 20% of our own electricity use, and we hope to ramp that up in coming years. We're well into transitioning our lawn equipment to all electric. In 2022, we bought 40 new uh, pieces. And lastly, we teamed up with Pepco and uh, BGE to install publicly accessible EV chargers within several of our parks in 2022. We completed the installation of 13 chargers in five parks, and we hope to complete three more by the end of this year. And I am getting to the end. Uh, for years, both Parks and Plannings have partnered with the University of Maryland students through a program called Partnership for Action, Learning, and Sustainability, or PALS. In spring of 2021, students from the University's Institute of Applied Agriculture partnered with us to propose a project to fight food insecurity in Montgomery County by growing culturally appropriate foods for community members. The students prepared a report including a site analysis of our Pope Farm nursery, a crop production plan, and a summary of socioeconomic factors impacting Montgomery County residents. 
Uh, we partner with the Latin American Youth Council and other volunteers to grow the produce. And then we partner with another nonprofit called Harvest Share, a volunteer run organization that delivers the produce to local food assistance providers. Uh, we have a very robust and growing volunteer program. You can see the hours dedicated for a variety of services to support our parks. Uh, last year, we had a total of 53,000 hours of service from over 10,000 different volunteers. Uh, well, we like to show the cost if we had to do this work all by ourselves. Uh, there's so much more value in our residents giving us their time and expertise to support our parks than what is showed there in dollars. Sticking with dollars, we manage a subset of our parks and programs through the Enterprise Fund, which generates revenue through user fees, which support all operations and improvements at Enterprise facilities. This includes ice rinks, tennis bubbles, event centers, boat rentals, summer camps, and much more. Well, the fund experienced significantly reduced revenue during the pandemic. I'm thrilled to announce that due to proactive management to reduce expenditures and maintain revenue that the fund has emerged healthy and is back to generating a surplus. Our FY23 surplus is expected to be about $4 million. And then two more to go. I won't say much about the budget, but as you know, the county executive will release his recommended operating budget next week. We will then come to you to describe the impact of the expected delta between what the county executive recommends for us and what we asked for. This slide just previews some of the asks that I've included in the budget to improve and enhance service delivery in priority areas. I won't speak about them, but I will be in the future. Uh, the council has been very supportive of the parks in recent years and restoring funding through the budget reconciliation project process, and I'm certain I will be asking the same of you later this year. Uh, many of the successful initiatives I reported to you on today were made possible by resources that the council restored through its final budget review and approval, so I thank you for that. And then lastly, you probably wonder why I'm closing with a photo of this infamous November 7th uh, plane crash into the power lines in Gaithersburg. Uh, one of the first first responders to the incident was Deputy Chief Thomas Baker of the Laytonsville District Fire Department. Uh, Tom is one of our park managers who's been with us for uh, about 18 years. When Tom arrived on the scene, he was given the task of communicating with the occupants of the plane uh, by cell phone, primarily the pilot. He stayed in touch with the pilot on and off for more than seven hours until they were rescued and kept the command post, paramedics, and the uh, family of the occupants notified throughout that period of what was going on. Uh, the planning board, as you can see, did honor Tom with a citation at one of its meetings. And Tom is exemplary of the type of employees we have at the Parks Department that allow me to report to you on so many success stories uh, from our department. So I need to close by thanking my 700-plus uh, employees of the Parks Department, and thank you. And I think we're here for any questions. OK, thank you for those very thorough presentations. Part of it was a trip down memory lane for me. Um, having been at a number of those events by planning and by parks as well. Um, uh, the Fairland Briggs Cheney uh, placemaking festival was fantastic. It was a lot of fun to participate in that event and I think uh, you know having those events well in advance of the master plans or sector plans to get the stakeholder engagement um, job well done and I think it's what we need to continue doing uh, moving forward. Uh, I, I do have a question about some of the, the uh, for planning, um, the equity focus areas. Mm -hmm. So at the council uh, and in county government, we talk about equity emphasis areas. Uh, is there a, a difference between the two that you're aware of, or is it just terminology? Uh, why don't I have uh, Carrie McCarthy, she's the chief of our uh, research and strategic projects division, who can speak more to that. And fantastic. And I'll say while she's coming up, the reason I ask is because tomorrow uh, at the Council of Governments, I will be making a, a, a brief presentation on our work on equity emphasis areas. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Stuart, for the invitation to do so. So uh, if it's very similar, this expands the work that we do with regard to this information. Yeah. <clears throat> um, for the record, Carrie McCarthy, Division Chief for Research and Special Projects at Montgomery Plannings. Um, some of this came about as just an aspect of timing. Um, 
COG developed their equity emphasis areas, I want to say, around 2018 um, for an environmental justice initiative. Um, and they did a roadshow in advance. We're aware of them. Um, but we felt like we wanted to do an analysis that was based on local data, particularly to Montgomery County, instead of regional data. Um, so we started the um, equity focus area process as part of our Thrive update. Um, and we rolled that out to the planning board in February 2021. Um, in the meantime, um, there's the George Floyd incidents. You know, the, we had been working on equity issues for a while, but it really became to the forefront um, of the conversation and the COG tool was available. And so it's my understanding that's how that became broadly adopted by the county government um, just because it was there. Um, so they're similar, but they're like a little different. Um, the data's um, income, race, COG, um, kind of double counts race to develop their metric. Um, our staff felt like language ability was really important, and so that why that's why that's added as a layer over it. Um, we've spent a lot of time with COG staff looking at both and figuring out, can we bring them together? Um, so. We really just have two tools. Um, some county agencies have, like the library department, actually used our equity focus areas. Um, an analysis by DEP used both. Um, so we have two tools out there, and they, they both have their kind of strengths and weaknesses. Well, that is helpful. I'll decide later if I need to redo my slide deck. Um, it's already been sent to COG, but uh, but at least it's another talking point. So so, so thank Ge you. Geographically, though, the, the difference is basically in Aspen Hill. We have more of the area of Aspen Hill within these areas than the, than the COG area. I, I noted that on the map that they were nearly identical. That's right. Um, so th thank you, Ms. McCarthy, for that. Uh, the, the only other question I have for planning um, is uh, regarding the trees. And, and uh, this is the first time I think I've heard that planning um, provides free trees. Uh, I know that DEP does that. Uh, and I love that in one of the slides there was that sign that says this tree is free. Um, that is fantastic. Good branding there. Uh, but uh, I, I'm curious as to maybe why p uh, planning gives free trees when other county, other county agencies or departments does that as well. If I can also ask another member of my team, uh, Christina Sorrento, who will talk about this. Sure. Thank you. Um, but it was reassuring to know that there were 98 this year and, and uh, similar numbers uh, in the years past. Hi, Ms. Renta. Hi, how are you? Uh, so that is part of our Reforest Montgomery program. And the, that program is funded by the Fee and Lou that comes out of the Forest Conservation Act. So uh, you know, I am well up to speed on that. that. These days. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's one of the many things we do with that money. So, uh, okay. yes. So that makes sense. That was okay. a, a short uh, and direct answer, and I, I appreciate that. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, the the um, so thank you, Mr. Stern, and thank you, planning for that, um, Mr. Science. I just and colleagues, I'll open it up. So if you want to get in the queue, feel free to text me, um, Mr. Science. At the beginning, you had said that there was no consent calendar, and every item at the planning board was taken up individually. Is that a change? Yes, uh, so far as I know, I mean the the prior board did have a a fairly long consent item, which they were not uh, uh, really advertising it for public comment at all. Uh, we have an administrative calendar, which we think is going to be short, but it's still open for, for public hearings. Thank for you. For public to testify. One of, the, one of the things that I had hoped that came out of the last six months, out of the crisis that was, was that we improved some functions. And we had heard from uh, residents and some those in the private industry uh, about the need for more transparency. And when you noted that there was no longer a consent calendar uh, and that each individual item was called up individually, uh, I think that is a step in the right direction. Uh, and I hope, uh, I don't hope, let me rephrase that. Um, I would like uh, future planning boards and members and chairs to continue that. Uh, sunlight is the best policy. Uh, we should always be having open conversations. Um, and I applaud your leadership towards making the planning board more transparent. So thank you, Chair Zients. Um, and then last question I have for Director Riley. Um, uh, just like tree conservation is a topic before the council now, forest conservation. Um, 
electric leaf blowers is a topic that we just spent two hours talking about this morning. And so uh, in one of your slides, you had talked about converting some equipment to electric. Can you share with us how those efforts are going? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I actually went to one of our uh, maintenance depots with our deputy director, Gary Burnett, behind me, and spoke to our frontline staff, the park maintenance workers who blow the leaves. And it was one of the most animated conversations I've heard in, in the department in a while. And it was a healthy conversation. It was about, you know, how long will the battery last? You know, how am I going to make sure that I can, you know, do my job for six hours? Um, there was one line of equipment that wasn't functioning very well or wasn't powerful enough. But I'll, I'll just say what I heard is we can do this. There's nothing insurmountable. There's a lot of different manufacturers out there, but you just want to get to the point where you are as effective with a piece of electric equipment or more effective than you were with the gas-powered equipment, and we, we are getting there. How many acres do you think are being used by the, the electric equipment? Uh, I don't want to venture a percentage yet. I'll come back to you about where I think we might be in the transition. Sure. Uh, I certainly will be following up with you. I suspect some other yeah. colleagues will be as well, not yeah. only uh, for having an interest in the county government leading by example, uh, but also the utility and the lessons learned, as you noted, uh, in, in making sure that the very large parks department yeah. is able to do its work with this equipment. So. Yeah, I can tell you that we do have, in, in many of our yards, we have a truck with all the electric equipment that you can plug in the truck, and then you just bring the truck back and plug the truck in. You don't have to power like we us homeowners do every individual battery. So thank we're getting you. there. Thank, thank you. Um, I'll turn it over to colleagues. Council Vice President Friedson, the Chair of the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee. Well, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. Really always appreciate these conversations. We get a chance for you to show and showcase all that your departments are doing, all the hard work the staff is doing. I first want to acknowledge Tom uh, and express my appreciation for, for Tom. I know the Planning Board uh, did as well, uh, and just want to acknowledge all the staff. Uh, many of whom are here today, a lot of whom are uh, working today while we are uh, showcasing all of their hard work and just wanted to express my appreciation and uh, all of our uh, support for uh, all the work the staff's been doing. It has not been the, the easiest time uh, at the planning uh, department, at the parks department over the last uh, many months, uh, but we just really appreciate uh, that uh, we have great teams in each department that are working really hard every day to serve our residents. I just wanted to thank you for that. And I want to thank Mr. Hill for joining us and for you stepping up, as well as Ms. Branson and Ms. Presley. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the fact that at a time of need, we had five capable, competent, thoughtful people to step up and to serve our community, to serve our county. And we really appreciate uh, the three of you in particular. And I'm pretty sure I heard a Sherman-esque statement uh, earlier, if nominated, I uh, will not run. If elected, I will not serve. So I just want to make sure I uh, heard, heard that uh, correctly. You, you heard it because I still uh, love my wife and want to stay married. Uh, it's well, we, we love to your wife, too, and we prefer you stay married. So uh, sounds sounds like a deal. But I think perhaps that was the, the big news of uh, today's uh, conversation. But, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, appre appreciate it and, and, and thank the staff. I just uh, uh, related to uh, planning, I'll start there. Um, appreciate it. We just received uh, the Rustic Roads Functional Plan and Pedestrian Master Plan. I think both of them will be reviewed by uh, T&E Committee uh, under your leadership, Council President, as Chair. Uh, pedestrian Master Plan will serve as a critical building block for our Vision Zero work and will guide us in a number of future budgetary and policy uh, decisions. So I'm really looking forward uh, to getting into that issue. Uh, and then the Fairland Briggs Cheney Master Plan, the Tacoma Park Minor Master Plan Amendment, uh, the Great Seneca Plan, and the University Corridor Plan. Uh, we're, we've got a lot of plans uh, to get on the agenda. We were just going through the, the June uh, uh, Committee for Planning, Housing, and Parks, and it's going to be quite a busy uh, month. Uh, and just wanted to uh, note in particular, there was quite a bit of discussion earlier about the uh, equity focus areas. Uh, distinguished from the equity emphasis areas. We did have a, a conversation about that in, in our committee. Uh, I think there's been some really great work in figuring out, uh, now that we have these tools, how to use 
uh, these tools and utilize these tools in the best uh, way uh, that we can. I'll note, uh, as I uh, did uh, earlier, uh, the uh, Green Bank bill that uh, Tom Hucker and I put forward, the Montgomery County Green Buildings Now Act, we included equity emphasis areas in that bill, and actually that bill is exceeding mm -hmm. uh, its, uh, its goals related to that. And so these, uh, uh, these issues are really important to us doing our work and doing it in an equitable way, and we've seen the fruits of, those labor, of that labor, and I think it's important uh, and really appreciate the, the focus uh, specifically related uh, to our county's changing demographics uh, that also look at the layer uh, on uh, uh, English speaking uh, less than well, uh, because I think that's a key uh, area of focus as we have such a large number of foreign born uh, residents and making sure that we're reaching them uh, in an equitable way. So just wanted to acknowledge uh, that work and I'll uh, add to the fact that uh, we have uh, reiterated our interest at the committee uh, and I know uh, the council president has reiterated his uh, interest as a council uh, to do more and more of our uh, master plan public hearings in the communities that are most impacted. Uh, that's certainly true of Fairland Briggs Cheney, uh, which we hope uh, to do in the community like we did with the Beers Mill quarter master plan that uh, then planning board member Fanny Gonzalez uh, played a significant role in. That needs to be the, the model. I think the pedestrian master plan uh, is a good example. Not every community is impacted uh, the same. They're all impacted, but some are impacted uh, more than others, and so there may be an opportunity there just as a suggestion. Uh, and I think this just needs to be the approach that we do, and I think it's layered on top of the really great work uh, that you're starting to do that you need to build off of, and we appreciate that you uh, are doing that in, in, in ensuring uh, that the outreach is in the beginning as the plans are developed. Uh, it's in the review and it's in the end, and I think that we've learned a lot uh, through these uh, processes, and I think uh, we're, we're moving forward uh, as, as well. So I just wanted to um, thank you for that. I, I did uh, want to note, uh, as the district council member, I'm very much looking forward to the Friendship Heights Urban Design Study. I think this is going to be a really important uh, uh, plan and, and will provide us with really important uh, recommendations and will allow us to build off of the work that we've been doing as a bi-jurisdictional effort with the District of Columbia. They've done a lot of planning work. We're now doing a lot of planning work. Uh, there's a lot of uh, momentum here, and so I'm really excited uh, about what opportunities uh, that we have uh, here for economic development and for equity uh, and for environmental sustainability. So I uh, really uh, appreciate uh, that as well. And I'm looking forward and, and just want to note, uh, um, uh, we're looking forward to the COG housing targets. I'll say this for my uh, colleagues uh, at COG since it was mentioned earlier. Uh, the committee is undertaking uh, an, an effort that is uh, just in its early infancy uh, with the goal of taking the regional and the countywide COG housing targets and developing them community by community by, by planning area. And by doing this, we'll really be able to understand what these targets mean and how we actually implement them. We can hold ourselves accountable uh, to uh, whether or not we're achieving uh, those goals. The countywide targets are important and they have allowed us to really focus in on housing as a key priority area, but breaking it down by planning area, by community, will really allow us to hold ourselves accountable to the implementation and to the hitting uh, of that goal. Uh, much of the work will start uh, in the committee, but the goal is to bring it to the community to talk about housing in communities uh, uh, throughout the fall uh, and then ultimately come back to the council uh, uh, with uh, a, a discussion and, and, and hopefully a resolution, a resolution to adopt the, the targets uh, by planning area like we did the overall uh, housing targets led by uh, Council Member Navarro. So I just want to note that uh, for colleagues uh, as well. Uh, just uh, quickly on the, the parks uh, 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 points. Uh, first of all, if there was ever an example of turning a parking lot into a place, we saw it uh, in your slide deck. We talk a lot about uh, that uh, effort, and uh, I think you're leading by example there. The committee took up the pros plan. I'd encourage uh, colleagues uh, to, to take a look at that. It's a really remarkable plan uh, for parks, recreation, and open space, really providing us for a vision uh, for uh, moving forward. And I just uh, want to express my uh, appreciation for that. There was a major discussion in that conversation I want to know for colleagues as well about community outreach 
and about how the decisions related to the activation, the expansion, uh, the, uh, the use of parks is a balance between those who show up to the parks and those who don't show up and why they don't show up. And uh, that requires ongoing work uh, and effort. Uh, and I just uh, want to uh, reiterate that point uh, here as well as we did uh, during the committee that uh, we know a lot of work has been done, but balancing that question of you know, the park's role within the community and the fact that it's a countywide park and that is a delicate balance that continues to need to be uh, refined and uh, know that you will continue to work to, uh, to refine it in, in District 1, but also in, uh, in every district uh, throughout the county because these are uh, important uh, issues. And uh, lastly, not necessarily in my district, the, uh, the uh, 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 Farm Women's Market is a really exciting project. As part of the state money that we receive for that, we receive money for the Wheaton improvements that you highlighted here and also Long Branch, which we worked hard to get all three uh, of those and uh, seeing what Wheaton Regional Park is going to be, I was gonna say could be, but is going to be, and I, my colleague from Wheaton will ensure that it will be that way, I promise, uh, is uh, just incredibly exciting and shows what our parks uh, can do when they serve the needs of all of our residents. And so I'm looking forward uh, to that, and I think it speaks to the fact that we have a countywide park system that has to serve you know, all of our county and all of our communities. So uh, thank you for, for that. My appreciation again to the staff and look forward to taking up many of these projects, these plans, uh, and these uh, proposals uh, in uh, our committee moving forward. Thank you, Mr. President. May I jump in just really quickly to pick up on something that um, Council Vice President Friedson noted, talking about the pedestrian master plan. Um, as Chair Zayas noted earlier, the planning board is holding a public hearing on the pedestrian master plan, public hearing draft on March 23rd at 6 p.m. Uh, we've gotten quite a number of uh, sign-ups already, but if we can ask for the council's help to help to spread the word about this public hearing, um, as, uh, as was noted, this is a countywide plan with a very important focus on helping the county be um, safe and attractive for residents to walk and roll. And uh, pedestrian safety is an issue that we've heard in different counties that have, uh, excuse me, different parts of the, the county, for instance, in our uh, University Boulevard Corridor Plan, the first community meeting that we held, a big topic of conversation was pedestrian safety. As we all know, Council President Glass um, has just released some uh, or introduced legislation that is very focused on this. And so we're very excited uh, to watch how that uh, legislation proceeds and to see how we can support that uh, because a number of the recommendations in the pedestrian master plan are reflected in your, in your legislation. Uh, so that's very exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Friesen. Councilmember Alberlinas. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and do also want to extend my deepest appreciation to all the planning board members, and that is correct. Uh, Chair Zients, you are not interim, <laughs> so especially for purposes of um, uh, approving these particular plans. And Council President noted walking down memory lane, that first image of the Germantown Sparkles event reminded me of the summer of 2008. I was the newly minted director of the rec department, and we had 40,000 people in the park then for the fireworks. And a pop-up storm arrived, and it was my call to determine whether or not we had to cancel them or not. So I reached out to the park police officer at the time who was on duty, and I remember him vividly saying, Sir, I am not a meteorologist. <laughs> so uh, I had, had to make that call myself. Um, and we did proceed with the fireworks. We did move forward with them. Um, and also, just again on a lighter note, love the image of the dog dressed as Olaf in the spooktacular picture. That was, um, that was pretty adorable. Um, so I want to start with uh, planning, and thank you so much, Ms. Stern, for your continued leadership. So I want to emphasize my deepest appreciation for the architect architectural design excellence. Um, that is quite a legacy, and you can see evidence of these remarkable structures and buildings that are being erected across the county. Um, that is creating a sense of place. It is also helping to distinguish us as a region and community. And so whatever we can do, in addition to the awards, uh, to continue to emphasize that, I think would be outstanding. Uh, and even highlighting one or two of the winners in slides moving forward, um, just to further emphasize how important that is 
in so many different ways would be great. So thank you for that. And I also appreciate the comments regarding the COG report and the housing needs and the aspirational goals. I'm glad to hear the committee is going to continue to focus on this. And I almost feel like in these presentations, you know, you have those thermometers when you're trying to fundraise and, you know, when you get to a certain point, um, I think we should highlight uh, projects that are in the queue uh, for housing that are going through the planning process and, and highlight them specifically um, because we want to see how we're doing and what projects are in the queue uh, that we want to encourage more of. Um, and with regards to uh, the Parks Department, this is a somewhat random question, but I remember a number of years ago, um, there were some plans for a third ice rink. Uh, and there was a location selected and one of the constituencies I hear most from are hockey parents <laughs> who are desperate for more um, opportunities that are out there. Could you just talk briefly about where we are in the queue with that project? I haven't heard about it in a long time. Yeah, it is. It's no secret. It's, it's at Ridge Road Recreational Park. When we developed that large park, um, we actually put in a pad for a future three-sheet ice rink. So there's space for three uh, rinks, the infrastructure is stubbed in, um, and we were analyzing our enterprise fund year to year to see if it was healthy enough to actually support the debt service on revenue bonds to finance the ice rink. Uh, I think we were this close before the pandemic hit of making that, pulling that trigger. Um, now that we're back in a better place, we're going to relook at it about the timing to do that. We would love to do it sooner than later. That would be a big money maker, just like Cabin John. I have no doubt that it would make a lot of money and it would have a large service area, given where it is. So let me uh, let me try to come back with some more definitive uh, feedback on what how soon we might be able to do that. I appreciate that. That would be terrific uh, to to bring back in the queue. I I know it would get a lot of support um, from a lot of different people, and it would be full before it even opened. Um, you know, based on the usage that we're seeing across the community and region. And as you mentioned, could be a revenue generator for the county and the department, which is important, particularly for the enterprise division. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about program open space. Um, so I know that program has ebbed and flowed, um, but just wanted to check in on where we are with resources that may be available and any advocacy that we may want to pursue during this session in Annapolis. Uh, I think it, from all I hear from my MAKO subgroup of Park and Rec directors, uh, all is well with program open space this year. I'm not hearing of any threats. It is back at record high levels the last few years. The General Assembly seems to be uh, protecting it. I'm not, I mean, it, there was a point where it was diverted for other state programs and there was intense advocacy around the state to uh, stop that. Uh, I know a law was passed to make it more difficult to move that that money around, but at this point in time I think our allocation in Montgomery County is very healthy. I'm not sure what the number is, but it's it's significant. It's more than $10 million. Thank you. And finally I'm going to channel some advocacy from some youth that we recently heard from. Uh, Councilmember Katz and staff from Councilmember Funny Gonzalez's office um, followed up with some youth who did not have the opportunity to speak at our recent youth summit um, with the, the youth town hall, excuse me, with the, with the previous council. And uh, overwhelmingly, there was interest in more drop in play opportunities for fields, particularly that have lights. I know that's a struggle uh, because we have so many leagues and so, many, so much interest in those uh, particular spaces in particular. But uh, if there is an opportunity for us to look at um, unstructured drop-in play opportunities for some of our better fields, including some of the turf fields. Um, that would be very welcomed uh, by a number of students who are looking for places to play, particularly in the evenings, particularly in the summer months uh, when they're out of school, which I think would really lift all boats um, and would be a great positive thing for our youth to be engaged in. Uh, and we desperately need more options and opportunities for our youth, particularly now. So channeling that request uh, that we heard yesterday. So with that, I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Councilmember Ludke. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And, uh, the only other parents who might be as uh, as zealous in their advocacy as the hockey parents or the lacrosse parents, and I might be one of those. But uh, now I, I wanted to talk about parks um, and uh, and thank you for the accessibility of our parks. I, I do have to commend you all on that. Um, I I have four kids. Um, and, but I, myself, spent much of the last 18 months uh, unable to walk at, at various times and for extended periods. And, uh, and during that time, I was able to get to fields and get to things that I needed to get to to be with the children at our parks. Um, so I greatly appreciated that um, planning and design in bringing them to fruition. Um, last year, I had the privilege of attending the Special Olympics Torch Run Gala with Sergeant Nelson from the Maryland State Police and representing the state at that event. And at that time, I met a Special Olympian from my district in Derwood who explained to me, he was a, he's a bocce player, and he explained to me um, how important bocce is to the disabilities community um, and of course we have bocce as part of our corollary sports program within MCPS, um, but there are no bocce courts in any of our Montgomery County parks. So on a day like today when we're talking about inclusion and individuals with disabilities, it seems appropriate to, to bring that up um, again and uh, that is my ask. I'm taking a page out of Council Member Fani Gonzalez's playbook and going, I am making a request, I am making an ask that we examine especially putting some bocce, bocce courts into our parks adjacent to the pavilion spaces that are available since that is often an area where they may be playing. Um, I know we have something like 90 plus pickleball courts here and I don't want to upset the pickleball people because they are very also very zealous, right? But let's have some bocce as well. It's, it's not a big ask and I hope we can make that happen. Thank you. I, I promise you we will look at it. I cannot explain why we don't have bocce courts, uh, but I am familiar with corollary sports. My son played allied softball at NCPS. Hockey, lacrosse, pickleball, you're, you're, you're picking all the tough ones here, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Sales. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to the Parks and Planning for the comprehensive uh, presentations. Just a few questions for both. I'll start with planning. Um, I know that you mentioned in uh, your uh, pat in the packet um, that there would be some Thrive 2050 metrics to evaluate its progress. Um, do you have any initial thoughts on what those will comprise of and how soon we'll be able to um, see what that initial list looks like and how we'll be tracking it? So the adopted uh, version of Thrive Montgomery 2050 already includes a number of metrics in each of the policy chapters. Mm -hmm. So we do have some metrics to start with. Uh, but we have included in our FY24 budget request uh, a request for funding to build that out even further um, so that we can have a more robust set of metrics and, a, and actually create a tracking system. Um, and so I can, you know, certainly we can provide you with some examples of the metrics that are already in Thrive. Uh, but again, we're looking to, to come up with an even, you know, again, more, more robust set, uh, assuming you all approve that funding. Sounds good. I, I love a good dashboard that shows numbers and data and we can follow along and track the progress of this um, uh, the Thrive 2050 initiative. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, since we're talking about um, metrics, um, can planning add a, a survey or some sort of um, tracking of our building stock in the county so we know what kind of resources assets that we have access to when discussing various projects and opportunities for redevelopment just to make sure that, that I understand the request um, are you looking for different types of buildings uh, such as Class A, Class B, sort of, or additional, if you wouldn't mind just explaining a little sure. bit further what um, you're thinking about. So all class uh, buildings that can be repurposed 
um, any government-owned properties that are vacant, any uh, uh, buildings that have been left vacant because businesses have not um, reopened since the pandemic, leases have expired, um, those sorts of, that sort of inventory if possible. I know we do have access to some of this data already um, in terms of uh, vacant government properties. Uh, if they're county government uh, buildings, obviously we work with DGS to get that type of data. Uh, but let us definitely look into this okay. um, and we can certainly follow up. Okay, all right, thank you for that. And I know there was some mention of um, some delays in some of the projects. Um, can you tell us a bit more? Do you have any insight on some of those delays? Um, I saw the delay of the Tacoma Park, minor master plan amendment, pedestrian master plan, um, Clarksburg master plan. Um, yes, and I believe the Silver Spring Communities Plan as well. With regards to the pedestrian master plan, there actually is no delay. Okay. Um, that was... Um, <laughs> uh, good afternoon, council members. Um, yeah, I had misread the chart. Um, so the delay is actually slightly a slight delay to the Fairland Briggs Cheney plan and not the pedestrian master plan, which is on target. So there is um, a slight delay to the Fairland Briggs Cheney plan and a slight delay to the Tacoma Park minor master plan amendment. Those are noted in the staff report. Um, there's also a very minor one month delay to the Friendship Heights urban design study. Um, Actually, that one's coming sooner, so excuse that. Mm -hmm. uh, Clarksburg Master Plan does have some delay. Um, the, two, the delay to the Silver Spring Communities Master Plan was um, put on the chart at my request. I had looked that we had two master plans coming into the full council in January to February time frame, when we know that we start budget full time in March. It's very difficult to fit in two master plans. Yeah. And so the first one was coming in in January, the Silver Spring in February, so I just suggested that the planning staff could use that time more efficiently by keeping the plan a little longer and bringing it in June as soon as the budget's finished. It, okay. There's no reason to have it sitting here um, unattended. Somebody could continue working. Um, and then the uh, CR um, update to the incentive density guidelines, that was just a one month delay. Again, that had to do with timing with the council's review of the growth and infrastructure policy. I had I requested just that one month push out so that you're not um, having both of those things on your plate at the same time. And the growth and infrastructure policy has a mandated approval date of November 15th when you do receive it. So, uh, and I'll just turn it back to um, Director Stern to answer the others. Sure, I think you've covered um, most of the changes. The other big change is a project that we haven't started yet, the Clarksburg Master Plan Amendment. Uh, we did push that out uh, from the summer to the beginning of next, actually summer of, um, uh, pushed out the hearing date from July 2024 to January 2025 uh, and that's mainly because the uh, up county planning team already has other major projects that they will be working on so this is just to better balance out um, the staff capacity but again that project hasn't started yet. Okay thank you for that. Um, the equity agenda, um, how is the planning department um, coordinating community input or planning for community input across the county? We do that through quite a number of different ways. Uh, so for example, if we are doing a master plan in a particular community, the place that we always start is looking at the data of who lives there um, and looking at those demographics. We do a lot of that analysis well before we actually kick off these plans because that can inform uh, who are the residents that we should be engaging with, who we need to speak with. Um, that helps us to determine if we need to translate materials and if so in what languages are there particular uh, organizations or partners that we should work with uh, are there different strategies that we may need to use in order to reach those residents so for example um, I mentioned with the Fairland and Briggs Cheney master plan because we have a number of residents who live in apartment buildings we decided to use a canvassing company um, to help us to be able to reach those residents because you can hope that they come to our events and we can you know, have the placemaking festival, other events, but that's a way to just go directly to folk, to residents, mm -hmm. uh, to talk with them. So some of those strategies can vary depending upon those particular communities. Mm -hmm. um, we also, um, you know, just in general, we have a bigger 
toolkit now and which to select different strategies. So I already mentioned the canvassing, you know, in-person virtual meetings, uh, placemaking festivals, sort of, you know, events in a community, translating materials, but we also do things such as uh, advertising at bus shelters where we will promote projects or we'll put different questions or pieces of data for residents and we'll ask them to text us or may include a QR code where they can just contact us and share their, their feedback that way. So we get folks who are in the, you know, in the midst of going about their lives. Uh, we've put up, um, uh, what are those like tent cards, not tent cards, but um, like garden signs with you know, QR codes, things of that nature. I remember, um, again, I, this was before I was with the planning department, but uh, when our department did the Veers Mill uh, quarter master plan, again, I'll give a shout out to Council Member Fanny Gonzalez. When she was on the planning board, she uh, interviewed residents on the bus um, in Spanish. So we've used a lot of different strategies, but we, we really look at um, the particular situation depending upon where we're doing the planning, and that helps us to decide what strategies to use. Thank you for that. And for parks, um, love our parks. Having come from Gaithersburg, uh, parks were 0.5 miles from every resident's home. Um, and so now that we are overseeing all of the parks, um, just wanted to, um, you know, we just heard from the um, developmental disability uh, community. Um, Council member Lutke asked about um, some of the games that are available. I wanted to ask about some of the accessibility of, at some of our parks. I know that um, I've heard from some constituents about some accessibility and some of the equipment at the parks. And I know that we're trying to make our parks accessible to all, but once they get to the park, how are we ensuring that they're able to navigate all of our parks and are there any uh, limitations at any of our parks that we're working on um, and how we are evaluating our parks for accessibility for um, that community in particular so we've uh, we do have a dedicated funding source in our capital program for ADA improvements we've had it for years it gets a recurring level of funding uh, we've made significant progress and I think the majority of our community parks now would fully meet the intent of ADA, but we're not 100% done. You can go out and find parks that are still in our queue and our list for improvements that we need to get to that we haven't yet. But um, I can be more come back with a more specific answer about time frame of when we really feel. Uh, I know we keep a database of barriers. Um, and when we created it originally, uh, we were under review by Department of Justice, and it was more than 10,000 data points in the, you know, from restroom ha door handles to pathways to uh, other types of things. And then um, also, once, you know, we try to make sure any facility we put in the park, particularly in playgrounds, is accessible. We want all our playgrounds to be accessible. Um, so uh, we, I think we've made a lot of progress. If you ever hear from a constituent that there's an issue, please just get it to me. And I can say either we'll do it right away or we're going to get to it next year. But um, DOJ has been uh, very complimentary of our efforts over the years on what we've done. Thank you for that. Um, I know that during the pandemic, we utilize our parks even more. And now that our students are back in school, um, wanted to find out if there's any um, in initiative, are there any initiatives um, for um, greater partnerships between MCPS and our parks for planning, events, recreation? Um, I think the answer is yes. Uh, I do work extensively with staff at NCPS, primarily Seth Adams, who oversees their facilities. We have a lot of interaction with the, with the way schools touch parks, but the short answer is we're open to partnerships with any government agency. If they, you know, we, we do have many, as I referenced, with our county's recreation department and others, but uh, we would be happy for broader partnership at MCPS. If any of their leadership wants to come down and meet with Tanya and I, um, we're, we're happy to do it. Okay, all right. 
That's all I have. Thank you. Can I uh, just jump in really briefly? Oh, yes, because please. that question actually reminded me of something I did mention in response to your question about engagement. Um, to take the example of the pedestrian master plan, which the council will hear later uh, in a few months when that plan gets to you. Uh, one of the things that we did to inform the uh, recommendations was a survey that we partnered with MCPS uh, to get um, survey data from their students in terms of how they get to school. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was just one example of a partnership that we did with one of our partner agencies to help inform that effort. All right, thank you for that. And I have also benefited from some of the programming, um, the yoga mats that you gave out during the summer. Um, I hope you bring back the yoga program and more opportunities for our community to um, get to know our parks and to enjoy them this summer. So thank you for all you're doing for our parks in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez. Um, thank you. I feel like I need to get up. We've been sitting for like four hours. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so I'm gonna go quickly, straight to the point. Thank you so much for all your work. I love working with the planning department, especially on the town hall, the transportation forum that I that I did a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was awesome, and we have a lot to follow up with. Uh, my team is still putting together everything, and, and as soon as it's done, we'll send it to your team so you guys have all that data of places where people uh, want to see improvement to walk, bike, roll, take transit, and drive. So thank you for that. Um, I would say for the pedestrian uh, master plan, I'm so excited that it's coming pretty soon. Um, when I was on the parking, uh, on the planning board, I started on that plan, and um, I wanna make sure that once you guys are doing uh, advertising and marketing the plans for people to get more input, that you also highlight that um, this plan has um, recommendations for people of all abilities. I think folks, they just make the assumption that we're not thinking about people with disabilities, and I, I do think we need to do more uh, to emphasize that, that we are, that we can always do better, but for us to do better, we need to he hear feedback from folks, what, what is it that we are not doing well, okay? So that's, that's the second thing. Um, then I would like to thank Mr. Raleigh, for all your work on the natural grass fields. As you all know, when I was on the planning board, I really gave you all a really hard time to make sure that we moved from uh, tire waste in playgrounds to, you know, to, to um, materials that are sustainable. Uh, same thing with the grass fields. And there's some movement that we're working on on that aspect that I'm not gonna say here, but stay tuned. My colleagues, we have more on this issue. Um, so that for that, and then um, I recently received a request from a nonprofit that deals with uh, urban farming. Uh, they first talked to the Department of General Services to find a, a property for them to uh, grow vegetables and fruits and all that good stuff. And they wanted to, okay, guys, I'm listening to you here. All right. Um, they, um, they were identifying Wheaton as a place where they could do this, and um, and then they came, you know, the place that they first uh, identified, uh, they had some issues with the lease, and then they wanted to see if they could use a park property, and that did not work. I'm wondering, and I know why, and I, and I understand why, and I'm with you 100%, um, but I'm wondering, what, I, what did bother me, it's not your fault, is that the Department of General Services didn't know that we already have that particular property, which I know you actually you mentioned it here, or maybe they forgot that we have plans on that property. So, wouldn't I think it would be so good if we have in in so many of the different maps that we that we have in the planning department and parks department identified properties where we are already thinking of doing something that is in progress. So by the time a request comes to the Department of General Services, they can just look at the map and say, well, this is not good because we already have something going on. So it would just save time. It will be more transparent uh, for everybody. Uh, and it should be user friendly. Uh, you guys already know how to do this. Uh, we just need to have that work done. Um, so we can, because this particular nonprofit was really frustrated 
um, and uh, I can understand why, and I think we just need to do better in terms of coordination. So that's that's on that um, issue on the ice rink. I had to echo my colleague, uh, Gabe Albornoz, my kids actually play hockey, and man, I had to take them all the way to Frederick in one of the seasons because we didn't have enough spaces in, in the Wheaton or Kevin John um, uh, um, stadiums, and um, the problem is real. Come to um, Pittsburgh. Yeah, yes, just a second, okay, good. The last thing I'm gonna say, as you know, uh, the Economic Development Committee has visited Mo Montgomery as part of our portfolio and also agro-tourism and all that good stuff. And I was thinking that even in, conjunct in conjunction with the pedestrian master plan and even the bicycle master plan that we already approved, I don't know, like four years ago or something, wouldn't it be cool to have some type of effort where you promote particular areas? It could be either uh, for cycling or, or for walking and connect that with businesses. Because when you have more people coming to specific neighborhoods, for example, to ride their bikes, right? A lot of people, they, they just do that on the weekends. But at the same time, it's not just about them coming to, this, to that specific location. Let's just say Wheaton Regional Park for the, for the sake of saying one thing. At the same time, we promote local businesses where they can just, you know, after I do my two mile ride, uh, I can eat an empanada at Cam Caramelo Bakery or have a beer at the Limerick Pub. Uh, or, you know, so combine the economic development and the business promotion with your efforts of creating more trails, of creating more safe places to for people to go to be outdoors um so i know i'm gonna have visit montgomery in my committee um maybe this is a great opportunity to have like a joint session between them between you guys in parking and plan because it's both park and planning it's not just the planning department it's, it's both and um and identify locations throughout the county not just waiting um so we can so we can like you know push for this um, I think that would be cool, a nice activity. Not now, maybe later this year, because we're all busy. Um, but just keep that in mind. And that was it. Thank you so much for all you guys do. That was not just it. <laughs> Lots of ideas in there. Um, yeah. And we'll circle back to that. Councilmember Stewart. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here today um, and for all the, the work you're doing. Um, I first had a question uh, for planning on the Tacoma Park Minor Master Plan Amendment. I know it was, it was slightly delayed. Um, and just curious on an update on like where we are and um, when you all are going to report out on that project. Sure. I'd like uh, Elsa Heisen McCoy to give an update. <coughs> Good afternoon, Elza Heisel McCoy, Chief Down County Planning for the Record. Uh, we are currently uh, developing our preliminary recommendations, and within the next uh, four to six weeks, we will be presenting uh, those to the community, the Tacoma Park City Council, uh, and the Planning Board, uh, and then we'll be moving. Um, towards a staff draft of the plan, again presenting to each of those folks uh, in uh, the June time frame, uh, ideally having a public hearing at the planning board uh, in July. Great. Thank you very much. Look forward uh, to that. And I, I saw you in the audience and figured couldn't let you come all the way here without asking. <laughs> so Thanks. thank you for all your work on that. Um, oh, so many things for parks. Um, thank you, Director Riley. And I just, I have so many thanks. Um, one for the the work in Long Branch and activating the park there um, that has been a wonderful event and um, as my colleague Natalie Fanny Gonzalez was just saying it's about activating the parks but it's also activating the local businesses and that is a wonderful example of how the local businesses have really um, benefited and joined in partnerships so thank you for that work there um, and I was just taking a walk this weekend and I got to pass the Hillwood Manor playground and that, I, I think that comes under the refresher uh, projects, um, and that's just amazing. It's a playground that really needed to get redone. Um, it was low down on the list, and I'm, I'm glad you all saw the need for that, and it's, uh, I can't wait for the ribbon cutting. It, it just, it really looks remarkable. 
and it is a testament to this new program, the Refreshers program that you talked about. I think it's just, from my perspective, is working very well uh, to address some of the really urgent needs on some of these parks. So. Thank you. Um, and the plan for the Long Branch Parks, I've been um, briefed on that uh, in more detail um, from the staff and I'm really excited about how you all are taking a very holistic approach um, and looking at those individual parks and really excited about it. And I see Mitty in the audience and I still want a map <laughs> of them. <laughs> all right, um, because I, I'm really excited about that work. Um, okay, so for, uh, oh, and I want to just echo uh, the bocce cor course. Actually, recently I was visiting, because it's so close to here, um, Main Street, um, just down the street and their cafe there, and one of the greeters uh, is a young man who does Special Olympics, and he's doing bocce. And I got to hear all about um, how he's playing bocce ball and, um, and the Special Olympics and what he's doing. And so uh, I do want to also put a plug in for that as well and agree with my colleague. Um, the one we have not heard about, disc golf. So <laughs> um, that is something I do hear a lot about, especially in the down county area and just curious on... Uh, <laughs> On, uh, on plans for that and uh, what you all are, th are uh, thinking about um, regarding disc golf. Hello, hello, Mitty Figueredo, Deputy Director of Parks, for the record. Um, we do have some disc golf coming that's in the works. I can get you more information on where and when. And our first, I'm, I'm glad I got the chance to come up here, our first bocce court is coming in at the South Silver Spring Urban Rec Park. Ooh. And, and we'll, we'll think about where we can put more. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is all I have. Thank you. And just thank you for reminding me about our park activation program benefiting small businesses. There are a lot of the craft brewers, musicians, artists, food truck vendors who would really like to come thank us for supporting them through that program. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Balcom. One of the advantages of coming later in the list is that the, the, your list grows very long. Um, so I just wanted to say to Councilmember Stewart, come up my way for disc golf, uh, the Great Seneca uh, Park, State Park. We've got it, have had it forever. Um, and then I also noticed that when uh, Councilmember uh, Natalie Fan um, Fanny Gonzalez was speaking, you were all taking notes. So I don't know if they all, if, if they have your list or or if their grocery list is done. I couldn't, I couldn't tell. So, um, so just want to uh, talk about uh, the, the plans. I'm looking forward to the Great Seneca plan. I spent many, many, many years of my life um, on that plan, and so I look forward to seeing that. Um, and then uh, Clarksburg uh, master plan. Uh, Clarksburg has grown so significantly uh, since the last plan. Oops. <laughs> and um, and so I think outreach uh, to Council Member Sales' perspective of, of getting um, everyone involved. It's so important to, um, <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> Council Member <laughs> Sales is doing. <laughs> It's been a very long day, um, but but outreach. So um, my office is working on really trying to, to get um, a handle on different communities in District 2, and, and Clarksburg is certainly one of those um, communities where um, I've been involved in master plans, you know, for the past 25 years, and uh, it tends to be the same people in the room, regardless of which master plan you're working on. And so I would really love to, um, to work closely with you all in making sure that we get a lot of different opinions in the room uh, on that Clarksburg plan. So uh, please consider me a partner in that. Um, and then uh, Parks. Um, I live right near the um, soccer plex, the uh, Germantown, uh, South Germantown Park, and we love, love, love glory days. Um, and uh, as a family, we've been going for years. We typically walk. Um, as you all know, that getting out, it can be a challenge. But um, thank you for that. Uh, and I just want to give a pl plug for Kites Over Clarksburg um, coming up this month at the Ovid Hazen Wells. Um, 
the, the future site of the carousel. Uh, <laughs> just want to bring that up. Um, and also want to thank uh, Council Member Albernus for um, talking about the ice rink. Um, that's important. That was not on my list. Uh, I put it on my list uh, as we were talking. And I couldn't end the day without just another uh, uh, point about leaf blowers. If you think if you think you had an animated discussion about leaf blowers, you need to you need to watch the um, watch the tape from this morning. Um, but I do want to, to just to say, um, do you know how how long it's going to take for you to completely convert to to electric? Uh, I just I know some of the legislation I've seen that had like a, a date of that was very aggressive that my team said, whoa, this might be challenging, but. Uh, I don't want to venture a guess, but I can come back to the council. I, I, I think it's really worthy of us reporting somewhat robustly about where we are and what mm -hmm. we're experiencing because yeah. we have so many on the ground people using this stuff. Yeah, thank you. And and part of the discussion was, was um, the timing of when uh, the industry can can accommodate and and I would really if we're going to ask uh, our private sector to do this I, I really want Montgomery County to lead uh, the county and Parks Department to lead on this so thank you yeah Th thank you we are a pretty big player with the industry that manufactures that equipment so they do pay attention to us so we have a good connections there and I just wanted to mention we'd be very happy to work with with you, Councilmember Balcom, and your staff, um, in terms of planning out the engagement for for the Clarksboro Master Plan. Great, thank you, Councilmember Mink. Um, thank you all for fantastic presentations, and to your staff for really, really wonderful work. This was a, an exciting presentation. Um, maybe even beat the leaf blower discussion um, of your. And I uh, wanted to, I have a, a couple comments and questions for each of you. Um, so for parks, I just wanted to give a big shout out to the pit at Fairland Recreational. Big fans in my household. Um, we had uh, been, you know, driving out to South Germantown. And, um, you know, even my little two-year-old would go on the pump track there. And we were always like, oh, you know, wish there was something near to home. Uh, and now we've got the pit. So it's, it's really wonderful. And then thank you. Um, on the partnership with NCPS question um, that Councilmember Sales mentioned, um, and tying that together with Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez's shout out about the natural grass fields. Yes, thank you for working on that. Really appreciate um, your expertise with natural grass fields, and I will just cite that as a um, point of intersection where we would, as a county, like to be seeing more natural grass fields. You all have a lot of expertise with it. We're talking about potential partnerships with NCPS. And I look forward to more conversations <laughs> in that vein. Um, and then, um, okay, to, uh, totally separate question. I have had some questions um, from constituents about bathrooms in parks. And, you know, we've talked about that a little bit. And it's a difficult question because, I mean, you know, to bring sewage all the way out there would be incredibly, you know, expensive, cost prohibitive. Um, we also don't have a, a great option for a porta potty company, um, but it's also you know that can be an accessibility issue. Parents of small children also you know for so I'm just want, throwing it out there as kind of a difficult question that I wanted to name. Um, you know I don't know if this some, is something where we would want to uh, think about whether like we can develop that county service and provide some good union jobs or but uh, have you all had any any conversations or thoughts about? that uh, restrooms throughout my career have been one of the most unsolvable issues yeah. uh, I, I mean I had kids grow up in our parks and play ball I, I understand um, we you know as you know we have standalone restrooms in staffed parks and you go to South Germantown Recreational Park Cabin John um, we do staff mm -hmm. restrooms clean them and they're my experience with them is Pretty good. You move to the community parks where we have baseball games. We rely on porta potties in general. As you noted, we have had a horrific his, uh, performance from porta potty companies that come and go. Mm -hmm. I have staff who spend a significant amount of time tracking down those companies and reporting very awful mm -hmm. situations and getting them out there. Um, it is, I'll acknowledge it's probably something that requires a little bit more concerted thought within my department. Um, uh, I, I have really not 
made it a project to figure out what the solution may be, but uh, it, it would not be a bad idea to have more focus in that arena. I will say we've had some success with some pilot uh, compostable toilets that don't require water and sewer. Uh, we have put one in. Uh, I don't really have an assessment yet of how it is performing, but there is some hope there. Um, it's great to hear that. Uh, <laughs> so it's great to hear about some hope there. I mean, I do think that this would be a question worth looking into because it really extends the length of time that any one person or family can spend at a park, and that's really what we're what we're aiming to do, and, and increase the use um, to more to more people and more families and so on. I do think that there would be. Um, a, a pretty good payback for that in my you know, unofficial assessment as, as just somebody who has been a regular user of the parks, um, but appreciate the, the thought on that. Um, our, for our friends at planning, um, a really fantastic hearing about all the different types of outreach that you've been doing. That is, is so important. Um, the, the placemaking festivals are fantastic, and at Burtonsville, um, Farrell and Briggs Cheney, just really wonderful. Um, and I especially wanted to note the use of canvassing, which, I, which is so important. Uh, to be able to go to the doors makes such a difference. You just reach people that we are, are never going to reach otherwise. And I just wanted to note that because um, I, it's a great model and we see that the more you do it, the more, the more you're doing it. Uh, and so that's great feedback for, for us to see. I'd love to, to think about how we might incorporate that on the council side, on the legislative side as well. Um, also noting um, the Four Corners area of my district and their particular interest in the University Boulevard corridor plan. And um, we look forward to, to working with you all to, to help bridge those connections as well. Um, I wanted to ask about the incentive density guidelines update. Um, that's something that's a little bit of a different bucket and is a big deal. So if you could tell us a little bit more about that and how you're going about it. Sure, I'd like to have a member of my team come and talk about that project. I'm the member of the team talking about that <laughs> since uh, Atul Sharma left. Uh, but uh, uh, for the record, Robert Cronenberg and Atul Sharma and um, uh, Bilal Ali are leading that effort, and it's something that uh, it's a, a, a program that we said we really needed to reevaluate. So, uh, see our public incentive uh, density guidelines update. It's really dealing with the public benefit points for our CR zone projects, and um, uh, they're applied to optional method development projects. Uh, and it's something that we felt like we really needed to reevaluate in terms of what is the uh, What's the biggest need? Uh, also, how are we applying those, and are we applying those in the right way? Um, the way it was set up originally was it's a menu of options that can be applied to a project. And as we've seen some master plans come through, the master plans have started to prioritize some of the public benefits, which we thought was a, a really good way to uh, really focus on what the needs were for that particular master plan area. Um, and so this reevaluation is very data driven. We're starting to look at all the projects that have approved uh, public benefit points and how they were applied and to kind of see the correlation between all of those. Um, and then really reassess what the, the basic needs are. So right now what the team is doing, they have finished the, the data set for this and they've started reaching out to various groups and I think even some, some of the council staff here as well uh, to find out how can we um, analyze this in a much more comprehensive way um, and, and get feedback on how they're being applied. So once we go through a work group, and we're actually going to be looking at community members and community groups, but also development groups to find out what is working best and what's not um, and what needs to be revisited. So the intent is to actually have some, something in draft form um, that we've analyzed probably later in the summer. Uh, but we've started that outreach now and started uh, the work group. Um, and the I don't know the I don't remember the the end date, but I think it's uh, uh, we have about a year uh, that we're working towards to try and get that um, to the board and update the council on as well. And it's something that we can keep the council updated on uh, on a regular uh, basis too. Thanks very much. It's it's much needed, and, and appreciate you sure. taking on a, a complex problem and using a data driven approach. And, yeah. and certainly, my office will be would be happy to engage in that as a conversation as well. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and last of that, Councilmember Katz. 
Thank you very much. And I want to also thank everyone for everything that you're doing. My district is the one district that you all have the least involvement in. The in the third district, most of it is is uh, the, the municipalities of of uh, Rockville, Gaithersburg, and Washington Grove, all of whom have their own zoning authority and and parks. But I did want to mention that I guess it's been a couple months ago already. Time has a way of doing that to us. I did visit the park police, and truly they do a marvelous job. Chief McSwain. Did a great job when he was with Montgomery County. He does a great job for for you all, for all of us, and it, and I got to visit the horses as well. I mean that was was interesting to me. Of all the times I had seen them, I had never been to the to the uh, to where they they uh, live, and and uh, to their, their uh, to the uh, area beyond uh, where the the park uh, headquarters are, and I have to tell you that. The park police in general do such a very good job and keep your parks uh, safe for all of us. And they do such a good job that many times we're not even aware that they're there. I mean, that's, but they gave us some of their their stories, the, the, the people that whose lives they've saved and and uh, people who they've helped. And and uh, they, they brought it back home for us and so I sincerely appreciate it as much as I appreciate everything that you all do they need to get a whole lot of thanks as well thank you very much and to the interim you know everybody else can say he's not interim. I know he's interim I know and in fact his wife will tell you he is interim <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyhow thank you Jeff take care okay uh, thank you to my colleagues for the good conversation questions and direction uh, this is a semi-annual report. We'll have another conversation in the months ahead, but uh, there's a lot of work to do in the meantime and appreciate you sharing with us all the incredible work that you and your staff and your teams and the planning board members um, have done, and we look forward to doing this work together moving forward. Uh, and Ms. Dunn, do you have any other comments you want to share? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you all, and colleagues, uh, we are adjourned.